This is Tim Campbell from Visceral Decay, Wartoke, and Fairhaven, and you're experiencing Poppet's Corner. All right, what's going on, everyone? Welcome to another uh, episode of Poppet's Corner, and uh, I got a very special guest, uh, one that's actually been requested, which is kind of neato. That's pretty interesting to me. I appreciate it, for sure. (laughs) So, Mr. Mr. Carlos Cruz, how you doing, my man? Very well, thanks. Good to see you, Tanner. Good to see you. Dan. Yeah, always thanks, a pleasure. Thanks for having me. At uh, we are located somewhere at a secret location downtown mm-hmm. uh, Los Angeles, and uh, this place is fucking cool, dude. Yeah, I dig it. The the vibe here. It is. Um, so, where are it's we? It's pretty much all about <laughs> that. Uh, so this is. I won't give away the location, no, but no, I no. pretty much this is going to be the rehearsal space where I rehearse with the band Ohm. Okay. Uh, which is which Chris Poland on guitar and Robbie Pag on bass. Which we'll get uh, into. Yeah, we'll get into that. Yeah. So this is uh, their spot that they've had for quite some time. So I'm just glad to utilize it when I need to, to rehearse on my own or to rehearse with them or to do stuff like this. That's awesome. And Mm -hmm. Chris was actually in here jamming. Mm -hmm. Earlier, yeah. He's just uh, working at a new guitar deal, getting a new guitar situated. So he's like really excited about that. So. Yeah, no, the first thing I, that I walk into, he's like, here, you play it. I'm like, right. okay, fuck <laughs> right. yeah. I was like, cool, like, I don't know, we haven't shaken hands yeah, yet, but here, here's my new guitar. Yeah. I'm Take like, it. I'm like, fuck yeah. He, yeah. he knew I played guitar, I guess, so. Just immediately, right? Right. He just, just he, you could be like, I don't us, know what Us guitar players thing. know exactly who plays guitar and who doesn't, I guess, which is rad. At least I don't, but. Yeah. No, I'm glad I got, got to the, meet him. He's got that power, so. Because, yeah, you were telling me you did all this stuff with Ellefson, and, and Chris is on Ellefson's new thing, so. Yeah. Yeah, so that's pretty funny how you were like, oh, I just met. Half of Megadeth. Half of Peace Cell's line. You know what I mean? In like a weekend. Yeah. Yeah. Half of original Megadeth right. pretty much in uh in three days. So That's it's pretty, pretty sweet. Good. But no, let's uh let's uh let's get into it. So the basis of the show is uh is about you. Awesome. So I'm going to pretty much go through your entire dis- like career. Okay. Um in music, obviously. Mm-hmm. And uh I if you will indulge me, let's By all we'll means. get to it. Okay. So give me what was give me when the first time you heard music. You know, um, it comes from my family, so I was born into it. So the first time I kind of could comprehend anything must have been by the time I could kind of, you know, walk on my own. Uh, I have a very large family, and when we have get-togethers, parties, it's going to be loud. There's going to be a lot of people, and there was always music. Whether it was live or not, kind of s- depended on the party and the occasion, but a lot of the time it was live. So even if I, you know, was being passed around as a baby... Uh, I'm sure there was music there one way or another. Usually um, the live groups were either my father's, because my father's a musician, my grandfather was a musician, so everybody on my father's side is musically inclined one way or another. The, the females, my aunts, cousins, etc., they can sing or play an instrument, and all the males can either sing, play an instrument, um, all in Spanish and Mexican. So everybody on that side of the family uh, came from music, was always around it so i was just like i said i was born into it that's kind of cool actually mm. do, you, do you remember going to like any concerts that your parents would play or not specifically going to but it was always like i said it was just regardless of what was happening um there was always music around so there's early family footage you know what i mean whoever was uh, getting baptized married first communions it's a religious thing or you know what i mean it's just uh birthday parties yeah ex- exactly and- all that all that type of uh, uh event I do recall there being some family footage. I think it was around two years old. This must have been for when my grandmother on my dad's side uh, remarried uh, after my original grandfather passed away. And there is footage of me that, you know, it's a live band and there's and it's a family band. So, you know, what I mean, it's all the instruments probably belong to my dad. OK. Um, so I went up there and I just got behind the drum kit, not knowing what I was doing. You know what I mean? But I'm sitting there, you know, at the snare drum, just kind of going for it. So that's like a VHS tape that I found that my family will put on every, every cool, now and again. Dude. I think it was like two years old. So not that I knew what I was doing, no, but, but just, just being surrounded by it. It was always there. And wanting to do it at that time. Maybe not even wanting to. I, I do remember a lot of the time growing up, my mom would yell at my dad to be like, well, why don't you teach him anything? And he's like, you know, when he's ready, he'll want to pick it up. Right. And now my mom yells at my dad because like, oh, that's all he does. That's right. <laughs> at that's first, what you make it, your living at. Yeah, yeah. Much. At first it was like, show him something. And then uh, out of my desire to do it, Maybe by the time I was ten is when I like really wanted to put an effort into it. Okay, uh, but it was uh, but I was always surrounded by it, so it was really just whatever was happening at the time. It was that kind of music from uh, my father or the family uh, or my older sisters. Um, you know, just growing up in, in the nineties, whatever was happening, pop music it was obviously very popular. Radio music, whatever it could have been at the time. Now, why why do you think your family was so musically? inclined like why do you think that you were just surrounded by it was that their, their I, d- I don't know or wh- something uh, or I, d- or? I don't know why it started with my grandfather his name is uh, jose cruz 
uh, rest in peace. I, he died really young. I think he passed before my mother even got to, before my mother and father even met. And um, he was in a plethora of bands in Mexico, usually 50s and 60s kind of romantic groups. Uh, we call them trios, three piece. Okay. Uh, all sung in Spanish, all doing uh, vocals, harmonies. Uh, acoustic guitars. He played the nylon string classical guitar. Are there, are there drums uh, no, no. So just just the three piece. So oh, it's yes. usually like two guitars and and like a bajo sexto. It's okay. called just like a, a bigger acoustic bass. Right. Like so not like an ovation. Like I know. Which, yeah. Exactly. That like round bottom, mm -hmm. kind of round back. Right. Exactly. You, you, I mean, a lot of mariachi mm -hmm. bands. That's exactly that's pretty much. Use, so. Yeah, similar to that, but on a smaller scale, um, without like a horn section or a percussion right. section, just like acoustic instruments uh, of that sort, stringed instruments. I love that uh, shit. Yeah, I love, yeah, I love it's beautiful. That. That's the one piece of uh, music that I still have, and it's the only way I really know my grandfather's. I have that vinyl, so I can put it on and I can actually oh, listen so you, to so it. So he was actually on a record. So you actually yeah. have family members that were like playing in the music business. Music, and, yeah, yeah, exactly. In Mexico at that particular time, it was, it was, it did really well back then. What's the band? What was it's his called? Group Los called? Tres Aces, which is just uh, the three aces. Okay. Uh, so it's just a Spanish trio, and uh, yeah, that record is. Hold it sacred because it's the only it's the, it's the start of all of this now, for me. What year do you know? What year came out? Oh, that's a good question. Specifically, that one. Fifties or sixties or forties? No, not that early, but definitely somewhere between the late fifties and late sixties within that decade. Okay, mm -hmm. that's that's yeah. super cool. Dude. Mm -hmm. So then, after after you heard that, what when did you start? Like, I guess get developing like getting into what we are now so what was some of your first recollections of like mm. the music that you actually enjoyed yeah listening to? yeah growing up so there was that you know at family events or that was just always playing because of my family you know we did a lot of road trips so there was always music playing you know what i mean whatever was popular like i said it could have been anything from like selena to like spanish rock bands like mana and stuff like that that my parents would have on or my sisters wanted to hear um and then there was all of the american music that my older sisters were into mariah carey uh, the, the the pop that came out a little later, the boy bands, the the female singers, and then probably when I got really interested in into it after, like mid '90s would have been when my older sister, her name's Carla, she started getting into rock music. Like it was popular stuff, you know, no doubt. Blink okay. one, Blink One Eighty Two. The pop the, punk movement. It, yeah, stuff of that sort, and that kind of translated a little further into more aggressive stuff. Mm -hmm. So later came bands like. Um, the next wave of stuff would have been like System of a Down early on. Um, Corn. Not y uh, that stuff. I, she didn't really get into any of that stuff. I'm sure they had it. I do recall seeing some of those CDs, but I wasn't exposed to it as much since I'm a little younger. I got like the later half of that scene, which would have been System of a Down and um, Slipknot when they were just starting out. So you must have been six or seven because mm. that was late 90s. And I was like eight or nine at that time. And I know yeah, I think by the time the first System CD came out, it was like 99. Somewhere, give or take, maybe a little earlier. Maybe ninety. Because I know toxicities. Yeah, oh one. So you're 01, probably yeah. right. Yeah, bro. So yeah, give or take, like being exposed to all that, just being on like the stereo. Right. And then, that's what she had brought to the table. And then one of my older cousins, who who's her age, she's about four years older than I am. And uh, one of my older male cousins, his name's Jose as well, um, was already getting into punk music. So he was already skateboarding and already started playing in garage bands. So that was a, a major influence on me seeing both of them just start to collect music on their own, just as fans. Uh, and that was pretty powerful. So he, sooner or later, would come through and he would bring, you know, the, the basics, you know, the Ramones, the Misfits. Uh, and then around the same time, uh, the band from New York called The Strokes put out their first record. Um, so my sister got that and was way into it. My cousin got that and all him and all his friends were way into it because, you know, it was still fairly new. It wasn't like so extreme and it wasn't too like hardcore, but it was like great songwriting. I, I love that band, you know what I mean? And I love, uh, I, I grew to, to appreciate it because it was always on. Right. And I was pretty impressionable there. So that's pretty much like the start and like the funnel of all of it. You know, I got some of this stuff from here and some of this stuff from there. And then you moved on to like, how did you move into like the, the rock world? It's like straightforward, just like. Yeah, that, w that was pretty much them too going from like, this is some of the pop. Uh, the excuse me, punk stuff, more extreme punk stuff, uh -huh. and this is more of like the the polished pop punk stuff. Um, but I, I want to say that System of a Down, as they kept putting out records, was like kind of the gateway in because I, I was obsessed with Toxicity for sure. Uh, my sister and I would go out and get steal this album and every like and uh, yeah, once those were already out, I was kind of already on my way. But definitely from Toxicity and always hearing my sister jam the song because she plays as well. So she's a drummer, she plays guitar. Uh, we jammed all the time growing up playing 
some of that stuff, that core stuff. Like I mentioned, No Doubt, Blink-182. That's cool. You're like a mm. family band playing. Yeah, exactly. So, we, yeah, covers. we would jam all the time. It was pretty <laughs> awesome. Uh, you know, that, whatever was happening at the time. So pr- I think from the System of a Down spark of just liking aggressive music uh, with, with, uh, with what I feel is a pretty damn good sense of song, um, that moved into showing up at whatever record store. It wasn't a popular one. I think we were like a fam- family vacation or something. I want to say summer 02, 03, something around there. Uh-huh. Um, and we're, we're in the CD section. CD section. Right, CD, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> they they still have those folks. Yeah, yeah they do. <laughs> they do. Uh, getting into it, and she was just digging through, and she picked up these two records. One of them was blue with a, an electric chair on it with a bunch of lightning, and one of them was... I wonder what that one was. Yeah, and one of them just was covered in white crosses. And she was like, which one should I get? And I was like... I don't know what either of those are. Like, uh, which which one sh- do you think you should get? And she's like, I really like this song on this one. It's called Fight Fire with Fire. Uh, but this one has a song called Sanitarium that I really like. And I was like, oh, okay. Oh, those. Two. Okay. Okay. You know okay. what I mean? So I was like, uh, no clue. Uh, maybe that one. The one with the crosses. Oh. You know, so that was, that was the one she bought. And she didn't even listen to it right away. I remember as soon as we bought it, we were going back to wherever. Mom was driving. She was in the front seat. I had her little red CD player in the back seat, and her and my mom were talking. So I took the CD. I opened it. I popped it in the you know right. the CD player, and it starts. And it's acoustic guitar. I'm like, oh, that's really nice. I didn't didn't. And you're like, I think I bought the wrong record. <laughs> no, no, but, but see, I, I was already <laughs> exposed to stuff like that. So I was like, oh, this is just really musical. This is really cool. But then it kicks in. And then you're and like, then the riff drops, and then the beat kicks in, and then it's over. Spark. Dude. That was it. That was it. The second I heard the main riff being played full on with the band. Then his voice came in. Then that little solo that in between the verses happens. I was this is over. Yeah. Yeah. Battery changed my life. Like, yeah, that was mine. Sitting too. in that back seat. Master Puppets, that was mine. Yeah. As soon as that song kicked in, I mm-hmm. was like, what is what the fuck is this? Yeah. 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 So that was really the start of me wanting to take music very seriously because that that was a piece of music that was pretty important to me still is like i still hold it in, in such high regard to me it's the greatest metal album period i does yeah i'd go b- between no. those two i always place like every, everybody says give me your top five it's like the the number one rank the number one spot goes to puppets and lightning they're very close together uh in terms of like stylistic uh well, and, songwriting and even and the structure too. yeah yeah i would agree you know the first song both both records starts acoustic is the is the burner Second is second's the monster title track. Third right. one's the Groover. Fourth one's the ballad. You know, and it and it picks right. up. There's an instrumental on both. Um, so yeah, both of those were were like key points in me wanting to pursue uh, extreme kind of music, well music right? yeah music of that sort, but just taking like instrumentation to the next level because nothing I had heard could be played like that. Drumming was never that extreme. Guitar playing was never that extreme for me. Um, you know, compared to the new uh, metal wave, those vocals were far clearer, mm-hmm. even though they were just as like powerful and extreme. So, yeah, yeah. I, I, big moment. I I am definitely relating to you right now because cool. now I'm going back to what my story and I'm like, mm-hmm. oh yeah, I remember. puppets. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Do you remember I, where? Yeah, it was it was uh, Fye. Oh, cool. And it was at the mall mm-hmm. on the top story. I remember going up the escalator, Sweet. going into the store, and I'm like, 20 bucks. Damn, really? For a record that like I didn't know, mm-hmm. I didn't know anything about sure. it. I only had heard of Metallica, mm-hmm. so I was like, I want to check out Metallica. Any reference point before that of uh, like heavy metal at all, let alone like that? No, I was listening to like Ted Nugent, so oh, it was cool. more rock. Right, right. It was on. more rock, rock. But mm-hmm. that, that extreme, that was cool. That was the brand and new. And then thing. I spent the money. I'm like, I hope this is good because I spent. You know, a yeah. lot of money. Yeah, that at was that a lot point, of money yeah. for me. Yeah, of course. Yeah. When I was 12 years old, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, no, it was game over. Right on. Like, give right me a break. On. I'll spend yeah, another 20 bucks to get that, you know. Yeah. Um, anyway, mm-hmm. going, so once, I guess once you heard mm-hmm. Puppets, mm-hmm. and you were what, 12? Tw- yeah, give or take, yeah, 12, yeah. So uh, up till that point, I might have bought a couple CDs on my own, but then from that point, then it was like, oh, I'm going to start collecting and buying my own stuff and really get into my own thing. And was that the catalyst to where... You wanted to col- start collecting everything that's kind of sounded like puppets, even though yeah. nothing was going to. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was pretty much it. Yeah, <laughs> fully. You know, there were plenty of things that were great. They, were, I knew they were all going to be different, even within the same uh, the context of that same band. Because by the time I got that, then it was the two thousands, and now Metallica was something very different. Right. You know, it was like Saint Anger um, was the big thing, and that was the first major concert I ever went to. Was the them at the Forum, uh, March fifth, oh four. And oh, wow, yeah, dude. got got smacked open. 
my buddy from middle school, him and his older uncle who liked Metallica, like I went with them. Uh, and that was it. But by then I was already like entrenched in it. It was like all I listened to, you know, went out and bought every single CD. Um, when, the, you know, so, some friends would gift us, you know, we do like a, a friendly gift exchange or whatever mm -hmm. at school, you know, somebody gave me like reload and I was like, never heard it, but I'll, I'll put it on, you know, and I was like, oh, well, this is very different from, from the stuff I know. Right. So it's there. Uh, but I, I didn't like judge it the way most people do now or, 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 or did, you know what I mean? When, when the it. changed happened. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was pretty much it for me. Yeah. Quintessentials are the first four, but I, I genuinely love the first five. I still like the first. Yeah. I, the first I like five. The first five, or, five to yeah. me are the, mm -hmm. are the best ones. Mm -hmm. So. And then like the live stuff from Black Album Down. I mean, Bo I th bootlegs I and, and Seattle is my favorite live concert ever. Oh, 89 yeah, me too. Seattle. You know no, what I mean? Yeah, One of yeah. the most powerful There's things I've ever seen. There, dude, there's no, there's no other concert like quite like it, and yeah. I don't know if, if it. There's ever, a lot of good ones, but that one just. For some about reason, it. for some reason, that that whole era of Metallica, like eighty four to like ninety one, mm -hmm. that was magic. Like all the all everything that happened in that period for them, yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, but I digress. So, and once you started collecting um, music. Mm -hmm. What transfer? What? What? Why did? Why drums? Like, why did you? Your main instrument is drums. I know you play guitar mm -hmm. and you, you're very versatile when it comes to that stuff. But why drums? Why was that your focus? You know, that's a good question. There was never like a, a, a why or how. There was always a drum kit in the garage, and there were always acoustic guitars, electric guitars, bass. Whatever I needed was always at my disposal, regardless of the quality of it. It was always around. So it was really just there for me to pick up. So I did start drumming maybe out of necessity to jam with either my sister or whoever was like there because they all my you know, my father's an electric bass player and you know, he can play guitar, etc. But um my sister was a drummer but at that particular time was focusing more on guitar because maybe the garage band she was in, she was the guitarist. Uh, so it was really just to jam with her where she wanted to play guitar. So I was like, cool, I'll pick up the drums and I'll, I'll start off simple. And I, a lot of times, whether they're students of mine or uh, just people I know with advice who don't know anything about it, I usually say start as like simple as you can. So that way you can learn the basics. I, I learned everything by ear at that time, especially so it trains your ear just as much as you can have fun playing your favorite song rather than like stressing trying to go from zero to 100. Well, so I started off with the, the, the basics of, like I said before, the, the things my cousin gave me, the Ramones, the Strokes, Misfits, and then, you know, into the Blink-182 No Doubt stuff, just, just to learn a sense of like, okay, these are the beats, and then now I can apply these everywhere. Yeah, the foundation thing. thing. Yeah. But going, mm -hmm. it's interesting that you say that, that uh, learning by ear, because not everybody has that. Like, mm -hmm. I don't have that. Oh, okay. I can't learn by, it's, it's really difficult for me to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't. Some musicians have it. Some, some sure. Don't. Yeah, I, I consider it now to be a practice in and of itself to to it, train your ear to do it. So yeah, with uh, with the drums, it was like okay, if I'm listening to it, regardless of how it's panned, uh, if, you know, for production, it's like I hear what cymbal he's hitting, I hear what drum he's hitting at what particular time. So let me, you know, kind of uh, Simon says it. Right, like if replicate you will. it. Yeah, let me try exactly to the best of my ability. And then you know what I mean. A lot of the times I would just go, okay, there, here's the basic beat. And here's the basic structure and the order. Forget about the fills. Forget about how complex. Maybe I don't have those tools yet. So let me let me play this first, and I'll just drill through it, and then I'll come back to it. Right. You know, once I develop that your skill. Funda your fundamentals. Yeah, and talking. I do that now. The more challenging music has gotten, and the the more uh, whether it's intricate or whether it's doing the complete opposite. Um, yeah, yeah. The fundamentals. It's like bare well, minimum. You, you just want to jam with somebody. Give them a beat. Well, you do what's best for mm -hmm. the song. Exa hand. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I can uh, appreciate and respect that. Definitely, to definitely. totally. Especially dude. when learning, though, I definitely felt like that was like one of the biggest tools for me. It was just like, you know, take a step back really quick. Don't be so anxious um, to just want to go straight into it and learn every little thing like perfect. It's like it's okay to make a mistake. You know? Right. All the pros make mistakes. Yeah, we're human. Every day. You know. Every so day. it's uh, that was definitely something trained by ear. Uh, same with guitar. Um, tabs were a bit of a help. Uh, they were just new, though, too. They were sure, because the internet, was, the internet was still just, brand new. Yeah, so finding new. tab sites or finding the tab books. I always remember and, and enjoy collecting every tab book I could find. That was cool. You know what I mean? So I, They still make them, I guess, yeah. I think. Yeah, they're, they're still helpful. Yeah, Definitely. Yeah. A lot of the time, they might be wrong. You oh, know what a I mean? lot of them were, yeah. I remember <laughs> Even back the, then. The, the Kurt Hammett one. Oh, my God. It I'm was, sure those dude, were wrong. <laughs> they, they were not helpful mm -hmm. half the time. Half so. the time. Usually, it was like this rift... It, it says this fret, but that but doesn't, it doesn't sound, sound yeah, like... Yeah, not even yeah. close. 
Yeah. Um, so <laughs> let's so let's get into like when I guess you first started mm-hmm. playing in like a, a band around here. So you mm-hmm. ri- are you originally from yeah, the born valley? Yeah, born and raised in, in San Fernando Valley. Okay. So I just kind of moved within the valley um, pretty much all my life. Started um, playing music in Reseda where my first home was and then that was really like formation of everything. That's where the first drum kit was. That's where all of the instruments were for me to, you know, to kind of pick up whenever I felt necessary or wanted to or just kind of had a spark of like, oh, let's pick this up and let's, let's figure this out. And that's, that's pretty much where it all started. That's where I would hear my dad's bands uh, rehearse. That's where I hear my sister's bands rehearse. My cousins, you know, the, who lived in apartments would always come and use the garage um, and, and rehearse at our place. So it was, it was great just to be exposed to all of it, you know, and just kind of suck it all in. Right. But so like mm-hmm. I'm talking like outside people. Like when did you start getting like together with your friends mm. and then – Form. Hey, we should we should uh, we should start a band. Yeah, like, likely. What was, what was the catalyst for that for you? So I was definitely already into metal. I was definitely already playing Metallica on my own, just headphones, you know, learning whatever I could. And I want to say all my friends in middle school at that time were either into metal like I was or into punk. Uh, usually being kind of the basic stuff, like I said, where everybody starts with the classics and you kind of work your way deeper. Right. You know, if either you start with Metallica and the greats here or you start with Misfits and Ramones and, right. you know, go down from there. So that's what we would exchange. So I was it was cool to always have that back and forth. Uh, so middle school was like, oh, we'd go over to friend's house. Oh, I know how to play this riff. Uh, oh, cool. I know the beat to that. So let's try to put it together. And it was just kind of for fun. Nobody really took it seriously. It was just something to do. You know, after school, you know, you, you skateboard, you go hang out, you go uh, run around the mall. You know what I mean? Check out some cool stores the if there were. Yeah, right. Back oh. then, back then it was. Uh, let's see, in the valley, there was in this particular area where all my other friends lived. It was uh, the city of Panorama, and they had a mall and they had a store there called Red Zone, which was a way cooler version of what Hot Topic is. Okay. So you know what I mean? It was like Hot Topic sold the popular stuff, so you could find what you like there if you you know at that entry I level. Found some good stuff there. Yeah, yeah, exce- yeah. Same. I have plenty of shirts from there from when this all first started, but uh, Red Zone was the very cool spot that we would all commute to, uh, either on skateboards or just walk and talk and hang and whatever. Um, and then further down, there was a spot called The Plant, which had a theater, like an arcade, a bunch of stuff. So it was either like go to homie's house to just kind of hang, jam, you know, fuck around and then go to Red Zone and then go to The Plant and hang out. So that was kind of like the little little trifecta right there. That's cool. Yeah, what arcade is, ladies and gentlemen, mm. for those of you who t- are too young to know, an arcade whiz is pretty much a whole s- plethora of video games that are like you know the size of Carlos. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> pretty mm-hmm. much. There's still there's a, a couple cool barcades happening, especially in this area, right, right here across the bridge. Um, and then even in the valley, a couple new ones are starting to pop up where it's like, cool, you just you know pay like ten bucks flat and get an hour free play it, stuff like I that. Think that. It's so it's probably a nostalgia like, thing. It really is. Like definitely, even like the, the uh, aesthetic of the entire thing is. Um, but I mean, regardless, it's something cool, something cool to do. It's fun. So, how did you? What was your first band? What was the name of uh, your first uh, hmm. band in high school? It would have been high school. Yeah, it would have been freshman year high school. Linking up with some guys that were again interested in the same music I was, even if it wasn't as intense um, as I was. Again, we all kind of shared the common ground of say Metallica. Um, and then at that point, I want to say it was start. It started off just playing covers. I'm just trying to think of who was in it. Let's see. At that particular point, it would have been myself Mm -hmm. and then three other friends. So one of the friends I met, his name was Elijah. We met in algebra. And then he had two other buddies who weren't in bands but would play music. So one guy, his name was Jordan. He was really into punk. And then this other cat, his name was Luke. Um, Kind of all over the place with that guy. He was, I I remember him being a a big Rush fan. He was the the bass player. You know, so he was already over there, and I was like, mm, I don't know that band. But, I mean, we all like Metallica, and I think we can all play, like, For Whom the Bell Tolls or something. You know what I mean? It's always uh, f- so everyone's fa- first Yeah, uh, so usually, like, something that simple we tried, and, and it just kind of developed from there. So by, like, the next year, like, as soon as sophomore year started, uh, we started th- in the backyards. The show was going to happen, and it was in a friend's uh, backyard in Silmar, which is uh, northern northern part of the valley. Trying to think, it's a lot to take in. I know it's a, it's yeah, far yeah, back yeah. now, dude. <laughs> now. It's more than a decade ago. Definitely, definitely. So this was the event was called Sergio Fest. <laughs> Is it, it, uh, it, that was his name? His name was Sergio. Oh, and it was okay. going to be in Sergio's backyard, so we <laughs> called it Sergio Fest. And it was just a bunch of uh, like two different friends bands, punk bands. We played last. Uh, we ended up calling the band War Ensemble. 
just we didn't, we didn't have a name, but we were covering songs, and the repertoire was like one original with no vocals, uh, and like ten cover songs. So it was just for you know the uh, obviously you like Slayer. Exactly. Okay. Exa- yeah, at that point, we probably did a bunch of medleys where it's like, oh, we can't play the entire song, but we can play this riff. So let's do like this chunk, and then we'll just go into this song and play this chunk, and then we'll go into this song. You know what I mean? Right. So we did a lot of that, which was pretty- That's kind of cool. That's like yeah. improvisational stuff, yeah, too. Yeah, so that was, that was something. If we didn't know how to play the whole song, then we would just kind of chop it all up and, and start doing medleys. So that was the first like real gig. And you know, we were all- Pretty impressionable, and it was all just for fun, you know what I mean? So freshman, you would have been 14? Like 14, 14, 15, going into sophomore year then, and so then... So 06, pretty much. 05, 06, at that point. Yeah, the first show was definitely 05. Okay. 05, for sure. Like, going out on our own, and not, not going to see some friends, or, or cousins, or relatives, or anybody involved with music already, because they were older than us, it was like us. You now, know? what was mm-hmm. the feeling like for you after that gig? You know, like, I've, I've yeah, yeah, I remember uh, my buddy's, uh, our guitar player Jordan's uncle, I think, gave us a ride because he had a big truck, and he gave us a ride. I think he stuck around. I'm not sure if he took off or stuck around, but, you know, we, we were punks. We were kids, you know what I mean? So if somebody was old enough to, to, to bring beer, to bring this, bring that or whatever, it was like, cool, it's around. Um, but playing the set, I remember it going over really well. I do have a vague recollection of having so- Angel of Death worked its way into one of those medleys. And specifically the double bass like part, you know what I mean? Some, After the solo, yeah, fucking it. Probably probably couldn't play the solo, right? Nobody <laughs> nobody could have uh, accomplished that stuff. But uh, yeah, I do remember that happening, and I remember it going over well. I was like, yeah, I did a pretty good job um, for for my age and just like not ever playing a show, yeah, o- on my own. And that was the the start of it. So after it, it felt really good because everybody was like, "Damn, you guys were awesome!" But we were all fifteen years right, old. But 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 when most people either only know what's whatever's happening on the radio or maybe punk music when we were playing some of the more intricate stuff then people were like oh okay these guys can actually just like play the instruments you know because a few bands before us were just kind of bashing away Mm -hmm. you know maybe they had original songs but they were um pretty simple straightforward you know ramones worship or whatever you know some really hardcore stuff some really uh horror punk stuff whatever it was going to be um a lot of the the bands it it seemed a lot more fun because they were just kind of using the the talent they did after the best of their ability and, and writing original and stuff. But yeah, when we came on, yeah, we played all these covers, but they weren't the easiest songs to play. Well, you know? I mean, I, the reason why I'm asking, because yeah. like, I can kind I mean, I can relate to the first, the, when I got off that stage, mm-hmm. I was, I felt like higher than, than sure. any mountain I can right climb. On. So like the, what was that feeling like for you? You know, it was one of those things where maybe after the set, everybody was, I guess it was not necessarily how I felt, but it was how everybody made me feel because of the reaction. Okay. okay. So that was like, that's kind of what took over. And for all of us to go, okay, this was actually, it was a really good first show. You know what I mean? Like we had pits going. Oh, that's all, all our awesome. Fr- all our friends were giving us props and kudos for playing our first show and doing that thing. So it was kind of those, uh, the subsequent like, okay, let's, now we got to book one like once a month at somebody's what? house, at somebody's backyard, and now we, we're going to do this for real. And, and uh, originals will develop. We'll probably change the name. You know, we'll come into our own um, as it happens. So that was like the beginning, I want to say, of sophomore year. So 06, 07-ish? Uh, that, was, that still would have been 05 going into 06. Okay. And then going into the next semester of school, which is now 06, is when the change, excuse me, the change of me wanting to play in a band that was a bit more established within even the valley so then i left that band so you wanted you so what i'm got kind of hearing maybe you can um tell me yes or no yeah. you wanted better musicians to play with i think overall it was uh it was one of those things that okay now i'm in a band <laughs> you know what i mean you're with your buddies and, uh, yeah exactly at that point it was like friends and maybe everybody wasn't on the same page musically or not really 100 percent certain on what they wanted to do uh either with themselves as a player or with the band you know what i mean having fun was priority nobody took it like dead ball serious like this is a business blah 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 uh nothing of that sort it was still very innocent it was still like meeting up at each other's houses uh-huh. You know, moms needed to, you know, talk to each other and approve that we could all hang out together and, and go to each other's homes and everybody was square and we can go to concerts together. You know, like that first band, we all went to the first, uh, to our first, like, Ozfest together type of thing in 05. 
uh, and there were exposed to a lot of you know professional bands, whether it was the up and coming thing on the second stage or all the headliners. Um, but at that point, like just sharing that kind of groomed everybody and kind of gave everybody their sense of direction on what they wanted to do. So that gave me mine for sure of just like, okay, um, I'm going around town and, and, and people, you know, around my little circle of friends and uh, pretty much wherever in the valley I could attend a show at, whether it was my cousin's show playing with his punk band uh, out in Canoga Park at the spot called the Cobalt Cafe. Yeah, uh, that's a very popular spot. Yeah, back in the day, yeah. Yeah, I remember that being uh, one of the spots where, oh, if we can play here, then we're on to something good. And we can kind of turn this into something, something a, little, a, little, yeah, a little more serious than just the backyard band. Um, but yeah, at that particular point, again, it was all still really innocent and we did it because we loved to do it and there, you know, we didn't take it too seriously, but yeah, that next year came around where say at, at a, a backyard show, I would see a slightly older band play and they had that shit together and they had a demo and they had originals and they had, Ooh, you know what I mean? They had and a demo. you know, so that, at that point I was like, that's the next step. That's the next thing. Original music. So what was your first step to getting to the next step for you? Leaving the band I was in okay. um, to join a slightly more established band that needed a drummer. Okay, and what mm. was the band called, if you don't mind that, Yeah, no, at that time, uh, the next band would have been, it was called In Misery, which okay. was more of like a crossover band uh, with a lot of... Uh, rockabilly psychobilly and like horror punk influence okay um so like my, my good friend who i like really connected with uh, oh i still speak to him to this day i see him i see him a, a lot uh, when i can uh his name is chris chris hung and this guy was into punk this guy was into metal and uh maybe by the time i was in 10th grade they were already seniors so it was kind of like oh well check out this band and this band and i've got my own rehearsal spot and this is where we record and these are th these are my original riffs and Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So I, you know, I looked up to them and I was like, "Damn, okay, I have the chops to play with these guys, mm -hmm. uh, but they're going to bring me up to like a whole new level because they're exposing me to all of this new, th uh, this new skill set that's required to play in an original band." Right. So it was, yeah, that was really impressionable on me. One, they're older. You know, they've got their own cars. You know, they they commute themselves to and from school instead of getting rides. Where you know, all that type of thing. You know, just kind of always being enthralled by like. And you were surrounding wow. yourself with better musicians than you too, to where your skill level, mm -hmm. just by pl your playing ability, would get exactly to their level too, because that's mm -hmm. what happens fully uh, in a band. You have to mm -hmm. surround yourself with better musicians than you, mm -hmm. right? That's fully. what it is. Yeah, and and you, everybody levels up, right? You know, so when I came into the group, I brought the skill set I had to play the music they already had written, and then the next step of them writing. Excuse me them writing new material with, uh, oh, well, we got this guy on drums now and he's capable of doing this, so now we can write this style of music or whatever it's going to be because he can play it. And you weren't, I mean, this is way, way, you're way young. So yeah, you, I'm still you 15. Weren't, you weren't playing to like a click. I don't even know if you No, nothing anymore. like that. No, so uh, the very first instance of recording was at a buddy's house in his garage, but he had just gotten this like 24 track. The Tascam? Uh, I, I want to say okay. so. I probably wouldn't doubt it that it was that Tascam, yeah. And uh, it we was all, all... We all had it. Yeah, it was all cut live, you know? It was all just, uh, oh, okay, well, uh, we'll throw the guitar in there somehow just through headphones, and then <laughs> you guys play the tune. If you mess up, we'll just do another take. You know what I mean? So it was really quick, kind of a weekend, weekend thing. You know, the thing that probably took uh, most would have been overdubs of just like, oh, we got to lay down vocals because that's like a separate thing. But right. every, everybody else can just jam together. Type of thing. So, what was the what, what was the demo called at that time for mm, you? So it was the band in misery. Uh, probably would have just been. I think there was just I a was demo a 06, and then there was an EP, and I can't remember. But I don't know if you were on that because. So the oh, okay, so the demo I wasn't on. That was like the first release. So that was those were the songs I needed to learn to audition for the band. Okay. Because that was like the MySpace era that that was being right. introduced. Uh, so my band at the time wasn't was either on MySpace but didn't have any anything up. And you'd go to Misery's page, and there was stuff up. So we were like, "Damn, that's, right, that's, so that's the, next the next thing." Step. Yeah, so you had to learn their stuff, mm -hmm. and then obviously you're in the band, and, mm -hmm. and your first recording was in a, a little ways into being in that band, probably over the summer where I might have joined the band, maybe like New Year, Spring, and uh, it played a couple shows, whether they were backyards or any kind of small venue or something like that. And yeah, it was just working our way up. So pretty much from being in that band and being in the band prior. And just kind of going to shows uh, as fans, 
those two particular bands kind of molded everything that was to come once things started to get really serious. So now with being uh, being in a band that was a little more established and starting to go to shows a lot more, that's when I started to make a lot of new friends. And we went to this one show uh, in Misery was playing, and this is before I was in In Misery, but it was In Misery, another Valley band called Legion of Death, and then this was one of the first uh, incarnations of the band Sacrificer from L.A. Right. And then the other two bands were Merciless Death and Fueled by Fire. Wow. And we And we saw this bill of bands, and it was at Universal Studios, which was in our area when these bands weren't in our area. And it was at the B.B. King's Blues Club, and this was like 05. And that was pretty much like the next light bulb right. for me. You know, Puppets did one thing. Uh, this did a whole nother because I was there and I was immersed in it and I was young and these guys were older and they had bands, demos, they all had a look, you know. That's cool. So that's when you were first exposed to the up and coming uh, exactly. thrash metal scene. Yeah. At that particular time, you know, Feel by Fire was far more of like a heavy metal band. Right. A lot of guitar right. harmonies, that soaring vocal. Merciless Death was the Slayer worship, you know, that we found and that demo sounded <laughs> shit, but we loved it and I like the masses. Um yeah, if you have had their demo out, the other bands might have had some demos out. But I mean, I was going because my friends were on the bill and I had heard the names of these other bands, but I'd never seen them. Right. You know, but thanks to MySpace at the time. Did you check them out before you saw them? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So my buddy was really psyched because he was like, oh, dude, you got to check out this demo. They sound just like Slayer. That was Merciless Death. Uh, and then we were like, oh, the Fuel by Fire band, don't know them. Uh, we put it on. It was like, dude, this is like Iron Maiden. You know what I mean? All these guitar harmonies are happening all the time. You know what I mean? The, the production's actually pretty damn good for, for being a demo. Uh, so we were all excited. Yeah, what is it, Life, Death, and Fuel F- by Fire? FBF, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that was the first instance of me like going out out of my way. I think I was 15, and all those guys were like, you know, then either a round of high school older than I was, you know, three to four years older, give or take. So. And, and this is back when there were all ages venues too, because there's not a lot anymore. That's kind of why I think at that time, yeah, why it played, mu- played yeah. such an impressionable part because that too we could actually go actually to get into it, yeah. get into the shows. Mm-hmm. Now, the, the funny thing about that show uh, that made it a lot cooler than just like, oh, this is like a brand new thing for me, and I'm being exposed to this brand new thing was that we went into the to the gig. We saw the first band play. We saw the second band play. Uh, Merciless Death was built third. So they started playing. It was great for, for like the, the show. And then they were like, okay, this is going to be the last song of the night. Uh, and we want to see some action. And we we're like, okay, cool. So the pit's about to start. There were no pits allowed. You know, not, that we, oh, not, that, awesome. not that we knew. So there were no pits allowed. So after the, they finished the set, we kind of tore the place apart. Um, you know, they had moved some tables and chairs, but all that got you know further Destroyed. pushed. And yeah, yeah, everybody was falling and jumping off stage and... Yeah, it was Dreams badass. Are flying and yeah, it everything. was badass. And there, there's, if you could probably YouTube it, and there's probably footage of that show, that specific show, that specific instance. Uh, I remember a buddy of mine jumped over like a table to get in the pit. Um, That's and, badass. And they shut down the show. Dude. Oh, they shut down the yeah, show. Yeah, so, so FBF didn't even get to play. Uh, and I forget which other band didn't get to play. Um, no, it's all good. I thought that was a. No, no, that's, that's not the. Uh, that's, that's not, not the, call. the call I'm waiting for. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so after. After the show gets shut down, and you're like, "Fuck!" Like, yeah, everybody, that was badass, yeah, everybody dude. was still young and obviously local um, to uh, local band status at that particular point. So everybody was still, you know, moving their own stuff, carrying their own stuff. Uh, moms and dads were there to support. Family were there to support. Uh, it wasn't necessarily like we have a fan base yet, but just a lot of people congregating to see this type of music. Um, peers, you know, especially coming from a from an age where maybe the modern metal scene that m- my first band just witnessed at Ozfest, like the second stage of all those types of bands that were up and coming in say 05 that were really popular right. versus M- Merciless Death Fuel by Fire and the scene that this was, you know, but about to create. Y- so you could connect with what was happening with that show as yeah, opposed lo- to Ozfest like Yeah, because here more- here we all wanted music from then. Right. And this this was yeah, of course, influenced by the then of, uh, of heavy metal, but this was obviously a, a far Happening different thing. Happening now, as yeah. opposed to w- what mm-hmm. was. Yeah, I mean, because going down that roster of the second stage. I can't even tell you. Yeah, it was, I'm, I mean, it was like Arch Enemy, it was Trivium, it was probably uh, uh, not Between the Buried and Me, but something similar, maybe an As I Lay Dying type, um, Mud Vein, Slipknot. All That Remains, all that yes. stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Shadows at that, Fall. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, at that time, that was 
popular. That was popular. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So that was just stuff that wa that we were exposed to because it was new, but no, but it didn't click with any of us. Not the way you know that it, that clicked when we put on Kill 'Em All or Bonded by Blood or. Now that, that to me, that's because of the songwriting. Uh, they, sure. they didn't have the songs that I cared for. That that's too. why I, mm -hmm. I that gravitated too. towards the older mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah, I mean, I once, I mean, obviously, yeah. Once I found Metallica, then I, I searched for their peers, and you know, you you you, you find the basics of Megadeth Slayer. It's all you, about you, the riff. Yeah, you, exactly. You find the greats, uh, the Sabbath, Priest, Maiden, and then you go down the wormhole and, and into the obscurity of all of those scenes. Right. You know. Um, the more extreme stuff didn't come until a little later, but pretty much that was it. It was the first band into the band in misery, doing the demos, being uh -huh. exposed to a scene, starting to play shows with said scene, and that's pretty much like the core, the foundation, yeah, of all of that. So for me, anyway. So because a lot of the time I would go just to hang out, even if I wasn't like in a band. Oh, you okay. know, I would commute out to Canyon Country just to hang out with Merciless Death, or I'd take the train out to Norwalk just to hang with Fuel by Fire, or, or whatever. Meet people around here in L.A. Amoeba Records was a big thing, or all the shows happening on the Strip. So that's you know that's around that how, time. That's how Hexen actually got into the scene. Kind mm -hmm. of uh, what I'm hearing is because you were friends. You, I mean, you made friends with everybody first. Yeah. Then started playing. Uh, started playing pretty seriously. Yeah. Um. So can we let's move on to uh, to Hexen because cool. I, I think that was the next project mm -hmm. in your in your uh, it was. career. It was. So, so that was pretty much it. We, how did it start? Uh, the same thing kind of happened. It was uh, you know, Hexen before me was already playing and had played with Merciless Death and you know different kinds of bills of the local scene that had happened from the area they were from. And uh, similar situation, you know, uh, you know, you, you get uh, maybe you're, you're working with older guys, so the priorities start to change a little bit. So what they want out of being in a band isn't what you want in a band. You're a little younger, you're a little hungrier, a little more ambitious. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the next logical thing for me where I was like, OK, here's a band. They need a drummer. They just put out this killer demo. Um, it was the third demo they had put out. So there was like the initial demo, then maybe like an eight song self-release, like full length. And then the, I want to say it was 07, the 07 demo they put out with just like the Roman numeral three on it and the black right, and the right, black right. logo. So as soon as I heard that, I was like, damn. And the this production is good. Was, was killer. Yeah, yeah, that was something that caught my attention too, where I was like, this is savage. The songwriting's really good. It's unique. You know what I mean? But it, it lent itself towards um, being influenced by a certain type of metal, them being of uh, the Middle Eastern you know, background that they're, they're from. Um, that had a lot to do with their influence, their background, et cetera, et cetera. So being into bands um, rooted in Megadeth, uh, the band Death, uh, introducing me to stuff like Corner and Cynic, you know, so it was... The more progressive Yeah, stuff. exactly. You know what I mean? It's like these guys could really play their instruments. So and my, they can write songs. And they could write songs by doing so. So coming into that and learning that material, level up, and then showing up, you know, and starting to play together, level up. So... Fuck you know. yeah. So, so it's just the constant state of growth. Uh, and you did a demo right before the record came out, too, if I'm not mistaken. Or yeah. an EP? Or s it was uh, it's just another demo. Pretty much that, that third demo was, was like the, the kind of game changer for me. It was like, oh, this is really good stuff. I'm a fan. I'm going to go see them. And as soon as that position opened up, I was like, I'm there. Like, did you just hit them up and say, hey, like, um, I want to try out? Or No, at that particular time, I think it was a situation of we have shows booked, but no drummer. So it's like, if, uh, if you can, can you help us out type of thing? Oh. You know what I mean? Can, can you make this happen so we can continue to play these shows? Uh, and then the offer to stick around was pretty much just given to me by doing what I do and, and being able to show up, play all the songs uh, and, you know, play, have a good time and get to, you know, get along as people. You know, because, again, everybody was older, you know, out, already out of high school where maybe I'm a, sen a junior senior in high school by now. And that's, that's so, so they're crucial. All yeah, so they're all attending college. So, again, it was always one of those instances of, like, these guys are always a little bit older than you, but... You yeah, but you, but you had a uh, 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 more mature mentality than, like, somebody that was a junior or senior. Sure, yeah. I mean, I, I put a, the, the priority of my focus uh, was always towards music. Right. Definitely. So, mm -hmm. when you... W talk to me when you um, were writing the, the songs for... Um, State, the State of Insurgency record, like how, how did uh, the writing process start for hmm. what would become your first, first record? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. So what had happened in between the two releases was the demo you were talking about. So it was the demo I learned uh, in order to help them play the shows. 
then I got the actual position to be their drummer, so I had left in misery. And then from there, we started playing shows. And there was interest from some of the indie labels, because at that particular time, it's 07, so a few bands were already signed. Well, the thrashing was fucking huge, dude. Yeah, at that particular point, everybody could play, say, the Whiskey or uh, the Key Club or anything. It's either you were opening for the bigger bands that were coming through on tour, you know, and selling tickets to be there, or you're selling your own tickets in order to play your own show. Right. So it, it went one of two ways, um, and that was pretty much it. No, I remember playing the Whiskey for the very first time. It must have been 06. Had to sell all the tickets possible to pay them and obviously didn't have any money to pay them so you're slanging tickets outside low key uh and then paying them as soon as you have any as soon as you have any kind of money and the worst thing about that was that i remember the first show there we played after the headliner oh get the fuck so whoever was headline like billed as headliner we still played after them you know so that was the first time and i played to man like 15 20 people that's so sad dude they still do that too i mean at that point i was what 15 16 so i was just like okay this is like the next thing, this is a very big room with a very big production, and here I am, you know, just kind of taking it all in, and if this is what's required, I'll do it, you know. So you were hungry. It sounds like oh, you were yeah, fucking definitely. hungry yeah, to, always, to always. go for the gold, and obviously you have. Mm, but, thanks. Um, but we're, so let's go back to the song. Yeah, so aspect. pretty much what, what happened was, uh, after being exposed to all these types of experiences. Excuse me. Sure, you're good. So, uh, yeah. And um, we, we had interest from labels because, like, like I had said, uh, all these bands were starting to get signed. Uh, Mercil's Death hit the Heavy Artillery deal. I think FBF did the, the Metal Blade deal. There were some other you know, indie things War, happening. Warbringer did. Yeah, Warbringer did Century Media. Um, and everybody just started to work and started to take off and started to do something. Right. You bon- know. Bonded did the earache thing. And yeah. I, I th- want to say that that was either yeah within that same year, maybe a little after. Um, those were probably the main three that I do recall that had an impression on me because I do remember even going to a show at the Cobalt Cafe uh, in my area uh, that was Warbringer, Fuel by Fire, Merciless Death, after the fact. So that was like, whoa. You know, seeing all these bands before, you know, you know what I mean? Before right. I'm really working myself and like really trying to do something with this. And what came about was... Uh, there was an interest from a label up north called OSM Records who was interested in Hexen. Old school metal records. Exactly, yeah, yeah, old school metal records. And they weren't 100% on like confirming a deal, but they were like, give us a demo, one more demo, just to kind of see what, what new material could sound like, and then we'll talk. So that's why we did the demo in between. Oh, yeah. So, so it was there for was a promo pretty much for pretty the label. much. We released it anyway because it's like, why put this to waste? Like, we'd already spent what we needed to spend and manufactured it and, and did all that. So, that was the long and short of that. It wasn't necessarily like we were wanting to put out a, another demo. We wanted to go straight into a, a record, like a full length, so we could actually do something. But it was good practice uh, in a studio setting with those guys to learn what that dynamic was like. Uh, what was the studio for that demo? Do you remember what was, what was recorded? Yeah, it was in, it was in Riverside. California. It was uh, Love Juice Labs. Okay. Okay. So everybody did their demo there. Like that particular year, I want to say that us, Ex Mortis, Bonded by Blood, likely a few other bands did all their demos there. Everybody sounded the same. It was great. <laughs> they had the same drum tone. Yeah, what exactly. You're paying, you're the dr- yeah, for, exactly. You know? you know what I mean? It's like you're paying for the time and then they just kind of sample everybody. And, you know, regardless if you were a metalcore band or whatever, they gave you the same drum sound. Well, that's, well, that's you know what every I mean? studio, man. That's what you're paying for. You're paying for their plugins. Pretty much. Pretty much. Like, yeah, the ro- I mean, the rooms were small. The tracking was small. The tracking was quick. We probably did that over a weekend uh, and just kind of knocked it out. So that, that ne- I mean, the production at that point wasn't like it needs to be this important to me. It's just like, let's do what's ever necessary to try to see if we can land this deal. Right. So we put out, it was another four song thing. Um, not necessarily that it did much for the band because we at that particular time were like, well, we don't really need to release this or make, make it all about this release. This is really just for, for them at OSM. Um, and then what we can kind of benefit from is shopping it out to more people to see if anybody else is interested. Um, but then OSN came back after that and then wanted to sign a deal to do a record. And from that point on... And it was a al- one album deal, huh? Initially, yeah, with like option for more. Okay. Mm-hmm. If that first one done well, because it was still really indie, you know what I mean? Like uh, there wasn't a crazy advance put up and there wasn't crazy promise of anything really. It was like we can make a record together, we'll distribute it. How's that sound? Cool. And that was pretty much it. So uh, the gentleman's name was Patrick. The hell was his last name? <laughs> it escapes me. I mean, yeah, it's been over, it's a, been a, de- it's yeah, been it's been over a decade for sure. And uh, I just recall that it was like, okay, you know, him, he came into play. And then 
now it's like okay you're you're going from the garage to the the backyards you know, to small clubs, to slightly bigger clubs, to being a part of a scene where a lot of people are starting to gain traction, whether you're a fan or you're in a band, and everything's starting to grow pretty substantially, pretty quick, and too. it was huge. I mean, yeah. that scene was fucking huge. Yeah, yeah, it didn't fuck around, for sure. No. <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of people, like, came out of every little corner. Yeah. It was great. It was awesome. It was so, great. So, the, but back to the songwriting. So, did you actually go in... To like, did you actually write songs for the album, or did you, ha- or did the guys maybe write it f- and bring it to maybe you? Maybe a few. So I think it was a collection at that particular point of like everything the band had done, because it was like demos can only do so much for a band. So it's like, oh well, these were great songs, you know, back in oh four oh five, um, but they're still some of our first songs that nobody's heard, and a lot of people may or may not hear this. So let's take that, let's revamp them. We'll do what we can to update them, you know, right. in, in two thousand eight. Uh, at that time, and we'll make a full-length record out of everything we're sitting on, you know what I mean? Just just to get it out there, because um, all of it is kind of worth something if we put the time and effort into it. So we spent a little more time going backwards and forwards simultaneously. So uh, when I say backwards, it was going into the first demos and saying, okay, what, what are the best songs out of this, and how can we make them better? Oh. Um, and then some, some of the B-side stuff would have been the newer material. So going through that first Hexen record, was Blast Radius, Gas Chamber, Past Life, Knee Deep for the Dead, Chaos Aggressor. All those were old songs. All those had already been recorded. Okay. One, one way or another. Getting into the latter half. There was a lot of songs. There was a lot that. of songs. Like on 13 record. songs like, on that thing. Yeah. And we, we did that. I, we were all coroner fans. We were like, their first record has 13 songs. Maybe our shit too. Um, and it's a long record. Dude. Yeah, it's fucking. I would, I'd probably cut like three out of the middle and make it a 10 song, like way more cohesive looking back now. But back then I was like, I don't care. Just like, let's do it. We'll have it. We'll put it out. Um, and gratefully so now, because you can go back and at least you have more material now. Right. You know, when the band's inactive rather than not. Right. So that's cool. Um, so the the only like real new stuff would have been the, I want to say the title track and the outro. Okay. Everything else had, had been recorded one way or another. Bedlam Walls. There's a lot of tracks on it. The Serpent, No More Color, Mutiny and Betrayal, Seditions in Peacetime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, Desolate Horizons, which right. is the uh, acoustic right. uh, instrument. So yeah, all that stuff was already done. It had already been done before. So it was just revamping it, getting it cleaner production, better production. And we went back to Love Juice Labs. Same producer, same location. But we, had a, we had a meeting prior. We were like, listen, we, we've, gone, we've been here twice already. You know, they, they did that, that third demo there. Right. And then we did the demo we did. So what had happened in between doing the record and actually going into record it was we had a meeting with the, with the main producer there and like, this is, this is the picture and this is what we're after. So we, production wise, we actually like sat down and took some time to be like, can we, can we go the old school route? You know what I mean? And just like try to actually record the drums and try to get a good sound uh, and not resample them and not re, you know, reamp the guitars and not reamp the bass and not compress it to hell and you know what I mean? So we sat down and kind of had that little meeting to the best of our ability with the budget we were allotted. You know what I mean? It was really just going for like a better, more natural sound than anything that had come from that studio. You yeah. Because we didn't pay too much for okay, so you, the budget so the band, was super small. Yeah. So the band actually had to pay for oh, it. Oh, we paid means, for that which recording. Which means that you had, what was it, probably a thousand, two thousand? If that, yeah. If that? If that, yeah. It was and like he would pay for the artwork and he gave us like a big thing of like artists. And obviously, Megadeth worship, death worship. So we were like, this guy. Gotcha. But with this, you know what I mean? He doesn't typically do this. Maybe uh, it was kind of touchy at the time. Still is kind of touchy. You know, <laughs> the, the graphic that's on there. Well, I, th- I thought you guys just liked the movie Speed. So Yeah, right? No, at that particular point, that particular band, like I said, the, the Megadeth worship lent itself to a bit more of a political standpoint when it came to uh, the lyrical content on a lot of that stuff. You know, uh, the basics, you know, nuclear war, violence, aggression right. is, 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 is kind of standard. Um, but then kind of getting a little more in depth at that particular time with esoteric things, the subject matter, Illuminati, blah, blah, blah. They kind of went down that right. road, too, where it was still about politics. Right. Um, so that's where Andre kind of, he just played to his strengths. He was a smart guy, you know, studying philosophy, et cetera. So he played to his strengths there. That really, that, that, philosophy, that education and philosophy really took place on the next record. Um, as far as like the lyrical content and what he was trying to say, so so when when you went to to Love Juice the next time around, um, was this the first time you used a click track? 
did you did you use a click track for the actual recording? the demo the demo probably was my first instance uh recording to a click track because this is what had happened at that particular point in time the way hexen operated mm -hmm. was through the midi program guitar pro okay so that's pretty Best much tool ever yeah for people that are like savvy to it and can use it it's it's really helpful uh, I, I find myself now not being able to do it and not wanting to do it like the way I used to. Like I used to compose on that thing for days. Now I'd rather just play and record and, and do that thing. So uh, at that particular time, it was like, cool, here's the song. Here's your part. Learn it. You know, come jam with us. You should already know it before you get to rehearsal. So the preparation of that was another tool of just like know your shit before you even walking through the door. Let's not waste time. Let's get to it. So that was that was a big thing. So sometimes it would be like, OK, here's the guitar pro. Uh, then here's an mp3 file of the guitar pro with just the click and just the guitars and bass midi so this is what you're going to play to that's what i recorded to so instead of jamming with anybody in the room or recording to any scratch guitar track or anything it was just we have all the tempos we have our grid we have our markers we have everything set before we even go into the studio a lot of bands do that dude now yeah a now now a lot yeah. of bands get on their shit and it's it's convenient right definitely it's a convenience you know, for sure time is a big thing money is another thing uh, and that were that was at that particular point the only way we know how to do. It. I had one day to do all the drums on State of Insurgency. Wow! So I spent like eight for to ten hours song, for thirteen or fourteen songs. Yeah, That's yeah, it must crazy. have been. Uh, well, it was it would have been eleven songs because two of them were instrumentals. Okay. Or like guitar instrumentals rather, with, without an actual drum set. Wow! So it was eleven songs in like eight hours. That's a lot. Yeah, in, in like a tiny little closet, way smaller than this. Uh, middle of summer. Or uh, late spring, rather. The record came out in summer. So late spring, so it, the heat was picking up. I remember just, by the end of it, I was, I was like four monsters in, in my underwear, sweat, <laughs> sweating. You know what I mean? Uh, but we did it. We did, and that's pretty much the, how the drums were recorded. And then, you know, the next couple of days of like rhythm guitar, bass, was all them, yeah. vocals. Uh, yeah, at that point, yeah, everybody You were not was, doing rhythm guitars? No, then. no, I, I did drums. acoustic guitars, though. Okay. So I was still playing, and I wrote a little bit on the song No More Color. Like, I wrote the intro bit. And I think I wrote the first half of the title track, State of Insurgency. So the opening riff, uh, the verse chorus, back and forth. And then from the middle out must have been a collaboration. And this was all in, in uh, 08? 08, yeah. So uh, all this now, happened within a few months of, and, and of getting what, signed. What was the uh, initial reaction to State of Insurgency? Because a, every band, it seemed like at that point, too... W was using uh, Repka for their covers. Mm. Like literally every band mm -hmm. in this in this small community mm -hmm. here, yeah, yeah, was using the same artist. I feel you. So what was the reaction? You know, to the actual record for Hexen's State of Insurgency in your, in your you're opinion. saying like my personal one or like a, a no, like from a fan from, base perspective. Yeah, or? like you looking out and seeing everyone's reaction to your record. What was it? I think uh, regardless of using Repka, I think what was on the album cover was a lot more striking. And a lot more like realistic, especially for the time. Oh yeah. Uh, rather than you know obscure monsters or some something of a fantasy. Right, like this is real. Like this could really yeah, this, happen. This this has happened. It it will continue to happen. It's unfortunate, but this is just some real life shit. Maybe because of his art style, it might not be depicted as like too realistic, but it's pretty damn good. It. I still love. You know? I still love it. Yeah, I'm not me saying, too. I'm not saying that. I'm mm -hmm. just like. Yeah, every, yeah. That's no. Just, I get you. Time, yeah, because a lot of the time, Repka covers can just come off like. Mm. Like my my personal favorite one is. Uh, I'd probably go Peace Cells, which is you know the gold and platinum record in that room over there. See, mine would be Scream Bloody Gore. There you go. Because no, that's a beautiful one too. Yeah. Because of the the, the stylistically wise oh, yeah. is what mm -hmm. I like. But anyway, yeah. go, So what what this was the fans' mm -hmm. reaction to um, State of Insurgency at that time? I think everybody was pretty happy with it. I know for a fact that I went into making that record with those guys, um, with this fucking fervor to do something better than what was being done. You know, I had heard Merciless Death's first record. I had heard Fuel by Fire's first record. And then when it was remixed and the artwork was redone by Metal Blade and that was put out. And then uh, when Warbringer's first record came out. Bondage and... I don't know if Bondage's first record was out by then. Oh, was it? Yeah, it was yeah? 08. Okay. So even if it was, I was looking around and I was going, okay, this is what those sound like. This is what those look like. This is the capability of those players. Let's crush everything about cool. any, any of those people. And any of you know their peers, you know what I mean, and they're still great friends, and I see them all the time, and of it, and, course, and it's but, all but good fun. That should but just, be your mentality. Yeah, yeah, dude. just come and a just competitive come, aspect. Yeah, right? fully because it's just going to produce this result of just more great music, you know. So regardless of the competition there, you know, and and the camaraderie over here, it was still like you know I'm younger than all of them, 
let's do some like real damage over here because I, I remember my buddy getting his license before I did and the day War Without End came out I didn't know what to expect I didn't heard anything prior you know I'd been talking to those guys a lot just as friends or whatever but he drove me up to the Best Buy I was like my buddy's band uh, their first CD came out I'm gonna go pick this up and I put it in the CD player and I was disappointed because the demo sounded better than the, the full length Oh, I'm just the, the production. E- the de- oh, the demo, not the oh, EP. Oh, the, the EP, excuse me. Yeah, the one, uh, one by one, the Wicked Fall EP. Okay. That they got signed Right, the one from. That, that's, that's, that in the, in the particular concert, whatever concert they, yeah, they exactly. did. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, at that particular point. And I'm just talking sound quality and performance or whatever. I was like, damn. You know, and they got probably the most lucrative record deal out of anybody from that scene. You know what I mean? And obviously we're put to work. It was, oh you know, it was, refre- it was, like refreshing to see them live and hang out with them live because they were so much more powerful than that recording did justice to, definitely. Um, and then, then you know, new lineup for the second record and then that came out and I was like, all right, cool, good, we're good. You know, that no, uh, no problems here. But uh, just in terms of like where Hexen was at the time, because it was a little later than maybe those three or four records, you know what I mean? But it, it was, was still it was th- in the first, it yeah. was still in the first yeah, era. Yeah, it was still in the first the- chunk of it, definitely. You know, I think our record label was probably the most DIY uh, and the most independent, um, but regardless, it was really just like quality content, you know, what we were saying, how we were saying it, what the songs were about, and just, you know, uh, again, you know, some bands wanted to do this, and we wanted to do that, so uh, already within thrash metal, you already had so much to offer fr- from, from from those five bands, you know, alone. Absolutely, mm. that, that sparked a whole new movement, too, dude. Yeah. Mm. Um, so talk to me, lastly, uh, uh, about... Go bef- before I yeah, start yeah. the next record or yeah. whatever, uh, about the state that your first music video. Oh, that was more DIY. That was pretty much just and for the like concept prom- for it. <laughs> it's yeah. a weird concept. Yeah, dude. title track, and at that particular point, I was like, you know, Andre's got a vision and he wants to do things um, uh, with with a certain vision. And in at that particular time, he was doing all the media and all the. Uh, all the production, all the videos, making a bit editing stuff himself, you know what I mean? So he was very much that guy, and I learned a lot from that, and that was great. Very hands-on, it seems. Yeah, Yeah, especially for for then when it's like, we need content, and he's got the resource to do it. Where was it done at? Where was that particular Um, video done at? Probably around here. It was downtown L.A., just some warehouse where we were able to get the basement of it, and, you know, we just filmed the, the... video portion or the playing portion rather uh just in a, in a corner of some j- big cellar and just kind of crank the the song as loud as we could as loud as the pa would go um you know we would mock play it it didn't sound very good but we did it anyway and then all the b footage the b-roll footage of uh with the concept line now with yeah with that particular song uh like i had said it, it had progressed from just kind of being like buses exploding acts of terrorism whatever political yeah jails whatever political standpoints to uh more of an esoteric subject matter of conspiracies and being chipped and everything to come right. uh with politics and merging of all of north america with a you know one uh, one currency and all these types it's of so sub- relatable yeah all, all these types of sub- subject matters for the time and uh, that was pretty much it you know it was just like a, a man taken prisoner uh, being chipped, being located, and trying to just escape from that. That was like the long and short of it. So obviously it's very independent video. Um, it's still up there. It the, is. The song's but you guys killer. did it yourselves, not the label. So yeah, that's exactly. Again, yeah. Ask. Oh, okay. yes, yeah. So pretty much I think everything but maybe distributing the record and putting it on shelves and online and uh, to be sold, you know what I mean, and to be streamed right. was all the label and everything else was yeah, us. Those and you're, yeah, so th- it was still very much like an independent deal. We didn't necessarily sign our lives away gotcha. or, 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 or anything of that nature. It was, it was too small to do that. We were right. just excited to put a record out. Like, and that record is, and that's why it's so hard to find now. So now I'm, yeah. Yeah, now I'm yeah, I came across a few of them just in an old box, like cleaning out some stuff. And I put, I, I have a few just for me personally, but then you I had a couple, keep some. yeah, I, I had a couple sealed ones and I put them up in They're within gone. less than an hour. Yeah. All these kids were like, "Dude, need it? I'll pay whatever. You know, it doesn't matter how far you dude, need to ship it." And <laughs> dude, I, I cool. somebody goes, uh, somebody hit me up about the, doing the rev- the interview and yeah. telling me like, "Oh, that those records are extremely hard to find." I'm like, "Really? Like, I found mm-hmm. it for like three dollars at Amoeba like cool. five or six years ago." So I'm like, "Oh, okay. Well, five I'm glad, or six years ago. I'm glad I." Uh, 
Yeah, it came well, up on one at all. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, obviously, I'm grateful to know you. Y'all signed it. You signed it for me too, Do which it. I thank you for. Mm -hmm. But my point yeah, is, yeah, I asked all those fans too that bought it from me recently. I was like, it's sealed. Do you want me to keep it sealed, or do you want me to open it, sign it? No, then, your, your choice. If you want it sealed, like I'll respect that for sure. Right. And they were like, no, no, open it, sign it. Like I'm just glad because we, we actually listen to our CDs. Yeah, dude. exactly. That too. You know, some um, people collect and. So, uh, let's go to your next. Oh, well, I guess your next record. Mm -hmm. I. I think it would be a. I think it would be Warbringer, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, if we're going chronologically, but if you want to stick to the Hexen story, yeah, that, then we can it, we can do that it, too. Let's stick. To, well, you know what? We'll do that. We'll do the sure. uh, band story. So cool. let's stick to Hexen. So you. Um, so the first record took a couple out. years. Yeah, the first record's out, mm -hmm. and then we did. You did a couple tours for it. Yeah, it was mainly a lot of local stuff, maybe some regional stuff, and then one full length month tour to promote that record. Um, so there wasn't a lot of promotion for No, it again, it was still really touring. DIY. So what had happened was was from inking that deal is when the personnel who was helping Warbringer was looking at us and wanted to help us and kind of do the same thing. So we were all very excited about that. So it would have been Warbringer's management, Warbringer's booking agent, then our label, and then at the time uh, their management would have been shopping State of Insurgency out to bigger labels okay. to see if anybody was interested in picking us up for the follow-up. So okay. that, that's kind of where that started. So uh, pretty much we were all aiming to kind of level up. So we hadn't signed a deal with the management or the booking or anything like that. It was still all DIY with these people like having interest in us and wanting to help us. So we did that first tour. And on that first tour, then all these people started coming around. Hey, if they're going out by themselves, then we'd be willing to back them because they're already willing to do it alone. You know what I'm saying? Right. And like lose money or like, you know, spend everything out of pocket. So let's see if we can make this happen and, you know, start it from the bottom. So they can uh, gradually work up the ranks, as anybody does. And did anything from that whole camp? Uh, yeah. Transpire? So this this is kind of what ended up happening, which uh, was like growth, and then kind of led to my departure. So, and th obviously this is just my side of the story. Right. So th this is all from this chair right here. So yeah, once again, it was um, we did that tour, and then on that tour we got offered another tour thanks to Warbringer's manager at the time, who wasn't yet our manager, but helping us very closely, and that's how we got the deal with OSM anyway. So once that came about, we agreed to it. And it was going to be a tour with Death Angel the following year. So then we set up a plan and we had this schedule. So it was going to be do the tour, come home, write the record, record the record, release the record uh, as soon as the tour starts. So that would have been 2010 and the remainder of 2010. So that tour must have been August of 2010. And then the fall would have been the writing, recording of, and release in January and start touring. And then more tours started to get booked into 2010. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, 2011. And we got home from that tour. And then it was myself and the guitar player, Tack, on one side. And then Andre and Ronnie on the other. And what I mean by that is that Tack and I wanted to play. And these gentlemen, again, everybody's older than I. Uh, and then Andre and Ronnie were already involved in education and getting their college degrees and going to university and doing that thing. So they wanted that to be their priority. Therefore, Respectfully. Could, not, could not tour. Okay. You know, so they were trying to scramble and be like, can we do fill-ins? Can we change and play musical chairs and just make the tour happen at all? So Tack and I were willing to do whatever it was going to take to get this off the ground and to just get it moving while they finish. And then when they finish, we can make it happen. But it was just way more trouble to not have the band involved in every little piece of it. So pretty much everything started to kind of deteriorate during the recording of what was to be the second record. Wow. So it wasn't like everybody was like kind of pointing fingers or mad at each other. It was just, you know, uh, the distance, the absence. You know, I was recording uh, maybe when they weren't there or vice versa that, you know, it was a different studio. We were trying to get signed to a slightly bigger independent label. So we were still gradually working our way up, but opportunity presented itself. Uh, and instead of moving forward and taking it and, you know, uh, trying to find something new, some, some, some sort of growth, it was the opposite. There was resistance. There was the fact that it's like, we live in the real world. Again, they're older family backgrounds, a little different expectations are a little different. Uh, they don't come from a musical household the way I do. So, like, you know, I'm, I'm, not I'm there. Yeah, exactly. I'm fully supported in, in what I do. So it's like you need to get on your shit. And this this is what it means to be an adult, et cetera, et cetera, versus, you know, head first. Right. You know, because I was ready. 
Right, sure. you were young. And you exactly. Were mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, at that point I was attending school and I was like, I'm ready to drop school, you know, to do this. And I did. So that was pretty much it. We started uh, talking to a, a label, a smaller label called Pulverized Records, which ended up picking up the second album. We worked with this other producer. So we did a demo for our sake after State of Insurgency just to try out some new songs. Three song demo, I don't think it was ever released, just for us. Um, and it had Grave New World, Stream of Unconsciousness, and one song that I don't think was ever released was called Dawn of Destruction. Okay. So this was a demo in between State of Insurgency and the second full length. So that demo is probably still on somebody's hard drive or somebody's got a burn CD somewhere. I don't know. Oh, you, I'm don't, sure, I, you don't personally I'm sure, have a copy of it. I, I'm sure I have one somewhere. I'm just got to be one. Um, so that was a producer we found... I think out in the Chino area at the time. And then he relocated to Rancho Cucamonga and then we followed him. And I think we got hooked up with him through the band Desecrate. Okay. Who was, you know, another LA band, Chase Becker, my guitar player and Warbringer now. Uh, that's how we hired him once, uh, once everything happened with Desecrate, he was free and I, yeah. br- I brought him in. A, we'll get to, to that to story. Yeah. We'll get to yeah, that exactly. Story. Yeah. But, um, that's pretty much how we kind of all knew each other and linked up with that producer to do the second record. But that was pretty much it. The timeline was there. It was like, we're going to finish the record. We're already here in the studio. Everybody recorded and did our parts. And pretty much after that is when we all sat down and were like, well, this is like the cold, hard truth. This is like the opportunities given and the reality of what's about to happen. So we declined everything and we were dropped from everything. Wow. That's so, a, but the record had been recorded. Yeah. Um, and but, to, but pretty much after that, once I had parted ways... Well, we'll I, 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 le- I left it all pretty much up to them. So, yeah, everything w- should have been pretty much done and recorded. Uh, the mixing process, the mastering process, that was all, like, secondary, uh, which I don't believe I was present for. Um, and then from that particular point on, I wasn't in the band anymore. So the record came out after you uh, joined Warbringer. Warbringer, yeah, yeah. Because mm-hmm. I do remember somewhat, yeah, like, so talking mm-hmm. to you, af- like, immediately after... The record came out, mm-hmm. and it was hard. To, it was hard for me to find a copy of the second record. Yeah, again, so that label was probably of maybe probably the same status as OSM, just not American. Excuse me. So it was one of those things where you're not an American label, and you're international. Maybe it did a lot better over there, or maybe it was a, a lot more present, right, in the European market or something of that sort, and not here. Um, I mean, you, if you wanted it, you mm. literally had to go to a Hexen show and buy it. Oh, there you go. That's exactly what I did. Cool, cool. I um, probably did the same thing, and I probably ran into those guys maybe a little later. We we had still like kept in contact and stuff. I don't really recall there being like any kind of bad blood or anything, you know. But but like with any relationship, uh, whether it's personal or business or musical, yeah, the initial separation. There's like, just some time where yeah, you just need that separation, that absence, that distance. Right. You know, when it happens during the actual relationship, then it's like. Then mm. it's kind of tough. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, were you initially happy with the production of uh, Being in Nothingness? Yeah, I didn't mind it at all. It was cool. The songs, I'd written a lot of that material. So I was sad to see it kind of fall on deaf ears because I had no part in promoting it, even though I really wanted to. You know what I mean? I figured, okay, uh, we're not at that particular level yet, but it's going to be one of those things where if we move forward with the plan and we keep working and we keep working and we keep working, there's no way this can fail. You see what all the other bands are doing. You see what touring nonstop can do for bands and where it can get you sooner or later, um, you know, in the right circles. And it was going to be the same team at that time. And Warbringer was very, very active. Uh, that, Hugely uh, active, like yeah. 300 days a year. Yeah, exactly. So, so active. pretty much with the same team behind us that they had, it probably would have been the same thing, but maybe in a slightly different market because we were kind of more different. technical. Yeah, more progressive, more technical. We could have gone into ver- a lot of different territory, not just play with death metal, thrash metal, black metal, or what. You know, we could right. we could have branched out too, uh, but we weren't necessarily in the same. We weren't the same band as Warbringer. So it was it was still metal. It was still in the thrash, and it came out of thrash, but. Um, yeah, it was, it was, ve- it was very different. So yeah, it, it was, uh, you know, at that particular time I had already made the switch because mm-hmm. I, I was already, before I even left Hexen, I, I was already talking with these guys in Warbringer, uh, cause they were making a personnel change. Uh, now did they contact you? Like how yeah. did all this come about to where it's uh, like- So the same gentleman, his name's Marco Barbieri. He was president of Century Media for a good amount of time. He'd worked at Metal Blade before. Uh, a true fan, you know what I mean? First and foremost, like anybody in the scene who's anybody, Bay Area thrash, whatever, knows this gentleman. Um, uh, you know, highly respected, lovely guy to death, for sure. Does a lot for us. Uh, 
and still does. Uh, he still manages Warbringer, always had pretty much the reason Warbringer is where they right. are. You know, took him from the garage, gave him the opportunity and put right, him... I, in, I have tons of yeah, respect for him. I yeah, really, put, him, put I, him to work. So that was pretty much it. He was willing and interested to help Hexen, so he did, and that's where we got... That's why we got where we did anywhere. Um, because he could take over like the, the business end of things right, and that's school tough us. To do, yeah. yeah, and school us uh, and, you know, really be a mentor in, in that fact. Um, so pretty much it was just like I was already talking with him anyway. And he was like, well, this is what's happening over here in this camp. If this is what's going to go down here, just know that everybody because you're going to refuse all these opportunities that these people are presenting you, then they're not just gonna, they're not going to want to work with you. You know, it's just one of those moments where it's like you can't have your cake and eat it, too. You know, so it's either you're going to revert back to the DIY thing and continue that way with Hexen, um, or you can take this opportunity and move forward with these guys because they're gearing up for the next cycle. They got to write a third record, they got to record it, release it, and then back on the road. Right, because they signed a, a five album fucking deal. Four. Four. Four, four. album deal. Yeah. Sorry. No, it's Four right. album deal. Yeah. Well, my yeah. point, a lucrative fucking contract. Yeah. Yeah. Especially, I mean, for young guys, you're like, yeah. That's a lot of albums, dude. Yeah. That's a yeah, lot yeah. of records. Yeah. I mean, now, yeah, the older you get, you're just like, damn, that's a lot. Uh, when you're 17, 18. Like, any Psh. any deal you fucking sign yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. so that was the transition period uh, thanks to, to marco and and uh, you know the second hexen record happened because of him as well and his involvement in the band oh i didn't know that yeah okay. definitely i mean the, the whole hexen at all happened because he was a part of it in a business sense and pretty much you know he's all he's most bands he works with he's always member the fifth member sixth member however many people you got in your band so you know same goes for somebody like ex mortis or okay what have you you know what i mean so it's like is he is it not he is is the re- so is that the reason why the record took so long for it to, for the recording process that i to it being released, released that i genuinely opinion? don't know all all like all i could say was i know there was a good amount of time uh, after me leaving then the mixing and mastering process and then that connecting with getting artwork and the booklet ready and all, all, all those dimensions pretty much set uh-huh. and then the label saying okay now we can set a date and we can have a plan and a schedule we didn't stick to marco's plan therefore the absence of him and the business end of things was probably why diy it took so long to get it out but it did come out gotcha yeah so let's move on to warbringer yeah um it's 2010 10. Mm-hmm. uh you had just joined i remember specifically being there nice. um because oh, yeah. we would yeah, play we played, with you guys yeah, yeah. all the time mm-hmm. um and especially in like at the metaphor in san diego and Escondido or whatever Hell yeah. um and uh, they had two records out mm-hmm. and you were just starting the writing process for the third um yeah. but my question initially is mm-hmm. you won't you you personally had one or two tracks only on the record that you uh physically wrote Right, because oh, yeah, to, me, to me that's weird because you write pretty much all every fucking album you're yeah, on. Yeah, you look, you go backwards. Uh, so the first Hexen record was like, a, you call, call it a compilation, call it a greatest hits. The debut record was like everything Hexen had done to that point with a few new to songs. move on to the next. Yeah, thing, exactly. Yeah. So the second, sorry to go backwards, but going uh, to being in nothingness, which is the second Hexen record. Right. Uh, yeah, a substantial portion of that was me presenting ideas to the band them liking them then me and handy guitar pro just going right. for it you know what i mean so um the intro track was me that i'd written in my room pretty much by myself and then we all collaborated to make the it last what track it was too, the, the last tra- same, same, same idea yeah so same idea they, they had an idea planting seeds you know what i mean and from that the collaboration grew so songwriting with them was was great because nobody was like afraid to be adventurous everybody was open and willing to go from thrash to death metal to black metal to prog to right. whatever, so you know what, what I mean? So all those components um, pretty much groomed me for the next stage, which what was... What was the, di- the the dynamic? What was the mm-hmm. difference between writing with Hexen and then writing with Warbringer? Hexen was guitar pro or being in a room behind a computer and Warbringer was behind the drum kit. Okay, so that that's a different dynamic. Yeah, we're, we're over here, you know, I think... Bef- before a, f- a formal audition, um, getting just getting behind the kit, and I don't think the whole band was there yet, but it must have just been myself, John Locks, and Keevil. Uh, and John Locks was like, I got this riff, check it out. And he started playing me the main, main riff to what later became Demonic Ecstasy. And he's like, This is what I want you to do, just hit the bell and just go do, 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 do,
that's pretty like before we even played any Warbringer songs. That's what we did. That's fucking cool. Yeah. So, so that, they knew they knew how the, you were gonna write with. Yeah. Them. John Lux was uh, already a fan of. Well, I mean, they all knew me. We were all friends. But right. but like the the main thing, like he came up to me and he was like, the reason I like loved everything about your drumming, and the reason I wanted you in our band after the fact, um, when we were looking, was because. I've seen you play shows on monster kits, but you can also play a four-piece drum set. You know, it went if and when it's necessary. You know what I mean? And if you can make that thing sound as big and Huge as monstrous as, as this fucking, fucking thing, piece. yeah, yeah. Th- then there's something there's something here we can use, and there's there's elements of this that I haven't yet introduced in Warbringer that I want to do. So I was like, yeah, John, let's do it. To you me, he, to me, he's my favorite uh, oh, yeah. songwriter out of Warbringer. Oh, yeah. No offense no, to no, the guy sitting all. across not from me or, or not anything, not even, but not I not really all. miss uh, his his songwriting in yeah no there's a lot that i learned from his guitar playing there's a lot i learned from his songwriting and i still use to this day you know what i mean the we call them the loxisms right um down to the tone down to the tone of me borrowing my friend's amp or asking john lux to borrow the amp he used on all those warbringer records to record later warbringer records right. without him oh that's cool um, that's a neat fact yeah so that was something uh i mean he's he's still there right you know he's still ever present in in the music because uh without him we wouldn't be where we are so that was pretty much the initial difference it's right away. Right away. It was just about let's get in a room, let's jam, fuck the computer. We can demo fuck stuff yeah. for sure, but we'll throw up a couple mics and just room mics. We don't care how shitty the quality is. We want to get behind, you know, our instruments, crank it, piss off the neighbors, write some cool shit. So, you know, so he had already been writing. I don't know if they had demos prior. I don't recall. And I showed him some stuff, but he was already showing me like Living mm-hmm. Weapon demonic ecstasy riffs shattered uh shattered it was a collaboration for sure he had like the the majority of the riffs and uh, i think i came up with the chorus riff that holds the chords i came up with the intro i do recall jamming it with him and uh andy locks john locks and myself uh and we had the the intro riff where everybody goes and i remember going john uh don't play the riff. Just play the two hits with me and let Andy drill through it. So that became the bass part. Where Dead end. Bass. Dead end, yeah. Bass, exactly. You know, where the bass fills it in. And we played that. We were like, oh, shit, that's awesome. And you know, so it was very organic, instant and organic. Yeah, correct. Yeah, definitely. Just being in the room and just feeling the energy and uh, actually, like, w- collaborating as opposed to like, oh, dude, I wrote this whole 14-minute tune. Here you go type of thing or letting the computer kind of manipulate and do the work. I mean, it's, it's a cool way. You, you know, I'm glad I had this skill set to move into this skill set and vice versa. It's kind of like knowing your journey so far and mm-hmm. we're not, we're not even halfway through it, but like there's, it seems like you're taking little steps and that, and that's really like inspiring to me because hmm. Thanks. Little, to me, it's little, true though. the little things are, ma- are what make the bigger picture. Definitely. So, definitely. I mean, um, it, it was pretty much every, I want to say from from backtracking from the ninth grade band every year was like okay what's the next thing okay right. what's the next thing what's You're the next always thing and after something something better, yeah right? exactly Growing. yeah you know and it was to that point where a lot of people would see the skills that I had and go yeah this cat you know what I mean he's just got the ability to keep on growing so you know don't ever uh, kind of uh, be content yeah. you know what I mean like with where you are find find you know find something. Uh, for yourself so you don't feel like yeah, you know the, the, the creative way, process the, yeah dude. exactly you know the, don't feel like the whale in the fishbowl you know what I mean like do yourself a favor get a bigger fishbowl yeah. yeah that's yeah. what let, I said yeah let yourself <laughs> out into the ocean and see what happens because that, that's that's always just been the, the constant you know what so, I mean so going to or, or sorry playing um, and recording uh, Worlds Torn Asunder mm-hmm. um, tell me about the studio for it so this was all like game changer even before getting into the studio let's see you know i was just working whatever day job with some good friends kind of hush hush low key and then uh i would drive from my place which is in the valley pick up john keevil in moore park and drive to newbury park where the locks brothers lived and then one of them would go get adam and come back down while i got keevil and met them up so if it wasn't all five of us in the room together it was a few of us in the room together uh, and different like conglomerations of the lineup. It was either me and Johnny, or me and Adam, or me Adam Keevil, or me Johnny Keevil. You know what I mean? It was like uh, everybody was always there to jam. Rarely did I ever get like a demo like tape or something sent to me online or anything like that. It was like, oh, I got these riffs. I'll show you in the room. We'll work it out like here and in, in the moment. So that was the whole record. Like we were jamming three, four times a week at John Locke's house to the point where his parents were like, "We love you guys. We support you guys. The neighbors hate it." Or just like, they're just like, you know what I mean? It's like, damn, like, I'm glad you're not writing anymore because just all 
spring right. or whatever it was, just nonstop, you know. That's War crazy. Break. I mean, luckily he lived in a cul-de-sac and it was like the corner house. So it was like far enough down to, where to not piss anybody cops? off. But yeah, it was a pretty nice area, super quiet. And we were super fucking loud. It was awesome. <laughs> Now, yeah. did, no, did, never got the cops called on us. It was just one of those things where, like, all right, certain time, cut it off. Oh, okay. You know, you you, you, yeah, we now. respect it like that. Yeah, for sure. So that was like the whole riding. Did they now? Did they, before you joined? Did they tell you the deal they signed and like this is what we have to uh, we're obligated to fulfill? No, nothing like that. I mean, it, it was pretty much just like, okay, th- this is the plan. This is the new plan. This is the new setup. You know what I mean? So we're all kind of along in for the ride. Okay, and cool. that was that was pretty much the long and short of it. It was like, okay, we just you know toured so extensively. For the second record, um, taking a break, personnel change. Recharge the Wait, batteries a little yeah, bit. Yeah, because I think Waking was written in a month. Dude, a it, month was reco- off. dude it was recorded yeah. in a fucking month. Yeah, it, so it was like, it was like w- tour. I think it was two months, dude. Yeah, I think, back to back. I think they had mm-hmm. two months. Two, one month to write and month then a to month record. to fucking record it. And then back on the road. Yeah, and then back so on the road. So this time it was like, all right, we want more time to spend on uh, writing and production, w- which we did. So it was still a month in the studio. Um but the the space to get to know each other, jam, maybe play a couple shows and do that kind of thing and really gel um, as a band, you know, who fucking actually gets behind the, the instruments and makes it happen right. rather than the computer um, at, in this particular instance uh, was, was really cool. That was refreshing to me and, and it made me a better uh, player, songwriter. Again, the, the level up because these are new tools. It's, it's a new environment. You know what I mean? These guys have already played however many shows they had played at the time. So it was like, all right. And I got to follow the drummer I had to follow. If I had to follow what was going on in the first record, no problem. Second record, I was like, all right. Well, Ritter's I, drumming is like. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Nick Ritter for insane. forever. You know yeah. what I mean? Because, yeah, that was something that was game changing for me because he, all of them were already older than me, but he was older than all of them. So he had a background. He had his chops. He had his practice. Right. Like, like nailed in. So, yeah. To so, a lot of people, that's still their favorite Warbring record. I wouldn't doubt it. Talk to a lot of yeah, people. Yeah, yeah, same. I see it all the time. That's why, I, you know, after uh, his you know, tragic passing, I, I've tried to put it together where I was like, well, let's let's pay respects. You know, we'll, we'll play the whole thing. A lot of fans are going to be really stoked about it because I know that it's I, their favorite record. I remember record. telling you guys. Yeah. I remember being the guy that told mm. Evil. I gave him a call. Mm. He said, yeah, heavy. That, 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 it was really that tough. That happened, yeah. It was really tough for me no, to, I'm sure. and that, to that's, find that out, you know. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I mean, that's just like tragic news for anybody. I mean, so young promising guy i mean I, I don't know what happened after the fact i know it was a mutual split you know um he wasn't working out for them he didn't really care for what the musical direction. W- yeah the musical direction of the band and whatever would have followed um so i mean it was just like a mutual split because i remember being at the last show hexen was supposed to play nick Ritter's last show actually it was the house of blues uh it was supposed to be hexen warbringer sepultura and angra and for whatever reason well i know the reason hexen got dropped uh, from the shows because we were working with said personnel and then we declined everything they had offered us. So they were like, nope, done, dropped. And then Warbringer, they weren't allowed to play. They showed up with all their gear and they were like, oh, there's no more room on on the stage. There's no more space. There's no more lines for microphones. So you guys can't play. Here's your money. Like, they're just the two bands tonight. Wow, so they got paid <laughs> for no reason. That's, that's yeah, great. It's, it's pretty that's cool. but, but it was like that was supposed to be Nick's last show and it never happened. But I was there just because I was going to go hang out. I was supposed to play anyway, but I just went to hang out. Okay. But, uh, but, but, but by then I already knew I was their new drummer. And they already knew I was their new drummer. So, you know, I, got, I saw Nick. I shook his hand. He was like, hey, man, congrats. You know what I mean? You're going to have a lot of fun. He, he was a good guy. Dude. Yeah. He oh, was, definitely. He was a good guy. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, it was always cool talk. It was usually like down to business. We would always like, as soon as I saw him, it would just be like, oh, talking drums. Sweet. You know, so. Um, yeah, all now, good times there. N- um, I guess you studio, recorded. Yeah. You recorded. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The studio. So you, when you went in, what was where was that re- the recording it was, studio? It was again? called the Omen Room. Omen Room. Okay. It was in Garden Grove, um, little little further south of Anaheim. Of course, that's and my area. Yeah, yeah. Totally. And we uh, worked with producer Steve Evans. Okay. Uh, and at that time. He's done a lot of stuff. Yeah, so too much to name. You know, uh, the, the key components that, that I heard at the time, you know, John, Johnny took care of all that. John Locks took care of all that stuff where it was like, oh, well, who do you want to work with? Who's around? Who's available? I was like, cool. In this particular instance, I'm still just the drummer. So y'all can handle all the business stuff and y'all can work it out and just tell me where I need to be and we'll make that happen. So, uh, yeah, Steve had done it. And if, like mo- more notably, some of the newer stuff he had done was like, Dillinger Escape Plan, some Suicide Silence, some of those more popular acts of the time. And then kind of backtracking, it was like Sepultura. He, he'd even done some sessions with The Cure and stuff like that. So there was a lot of cool stuff. But he knew what he wanted, uh, and he knew 
his operation and he knew how to get the best out of you and we all leveled up that session schooled all of us like you thought you knew your not shit? sugar nope. no no not yeah <laughs> definitely not not sugarcoating a damn thing we went in there and he was like is that as hard as you can hit no not cutting it all right come in and he would show me the waveforms and the difference in the waveforms of my snare drum and be like you see this one i need all of this every single hit make it happen you know what i mean so just take after take after <laughs> take <laughs> yeah it didn't it didn't matter uh what i thought i knew or anything like that that guy schooled us and we, we all leveled up guitar playing timing the everything from like uh the delicacies of like the feel of it to just like you know how exact he needed things to be so the, he didn't the have velocities to, of all so he hit, didn't have yes. to edit it you know what i mean so it was naturally played you know what i mean that's it's, good and bad i don't i don't like working like that so no it was pretty meticulous this yeah. th- this guy was down to the nitty-gritty and he would call you out when he needed to call you out that's and great. you know not necessarily arguments but there was a lot of just like all right there's the way we hear it there's the way it was executed is this good enough it wasn't good enough for him therefore it wasn't good enough for us so you know down to uh to teaching Kivel how to do things properly to teaching uh <laughs> <laughs> to teaching all of us how to, how to do things properly pretty much do you hear that going no. on that? <laughs> you hear something no no the I, gong oh, <laughs> maybe the, the gong on the door the gong on the door yeah no. that's usually an indication that something's happening but uh, oh god no we should be fine um yeah, so, yeah, uh, praise Steve Evitz for kicking all our asses in the studio for that one. But it was one of those, one of those situations where it was, uh, you know, a very nice studio, very nice rooms, very nice equipment. This guy, I had never been in any situation like this. Till that point, you know, uh, all of my records done at that point were out-of-pocket, DIY, even at probably more than likely, you know, whatever I could save up from working my whatever jobs to borrowing from parents to everybody just kind of putting in. This was like, no, here's your budget. Here's the producer allocated for said budget. Here's the time for the budget, and here you go. You know what That's I mean? That's so kind of cool. I've never done yeah. a record We're, like that. Yeah, so that, that first um, Hexen record where it was like, no, 11 songs, eight hours, here you go. This was like, oh, okay, cool. I got the week. So I could focus on this, you know, right. and we can get good tone. Um, and you were still young, too. You're, you, yeah, at 2011 that point. 2011 was like... I uh, wasn't even 21. Yeah. Like, I remember playing some Warbringer shows even prior to that. and uh, They wouldn't let you in. Yeah, you oh, got to stand yeah. outside until you play, bro. I was like, all right. That, I remember those Whatever. days. <laughs> yeah. Ain't that a bitch? It is. Ain't that a bitch? So, but, but, yeah, that was uh, one of those situations where it's, and you know, I could sit in the room when they were recording other instruments when I was already done. Uh, I sit in the control room, rather, but don't say anything. No. Because you know, I was just there to listen. I was there to learn. I was there to, like, absorb what Steve was going to do with John, Adam, Andy, and Keeble. Oh, okay. You know, or a lot of the time it was like, no, just go upstairs. You know what I mean? Like, let us f- figure this out. Not to me personally, but to everybody. It was like, let me do what I need to do to get the best out of everybody. And what I need is to just work with you and drill right. this there's, process. There's, there's too many cooks in the kitchen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he he was fucking executive. I love that. Yeah, totally through and through. Yeah, but we were all school. You have to have that guy, dude. Yeah, oh. uh, but you hear it in the record. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like you hear the first Warbringer record what the fuck you hear the second one you're like all right cool this is going in a much better direction. you hear the third one the sonics of it the weight of it you know the songs are very different from the second um but at that point songwriting wise everybody was kind of into different stuff you know johnny wanted to do some of the crustier stuff something a, a little more grind something a bit more death metal something a bit more um noisy and adam was very uh very much influenced by death metal black metal specifically like melodic death metal Mm -hmm. um so you know his songs of uh like future age is gone and savagery um were happening over here where johnny was writing demonic ecstasy and um and then i presented some riffs that i had and uh, again it was the more progressive kind of technical thing opened up acoustic and then had all these crazy time changes or whatever the fuck. And then, so uh, why uh, why Living Weapon mm. and uh, Shattered Like Glass? Why are those two for the uh, the singles? They're just kind of obvious singles. Okay. You know, the 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 riff style, the structure of the songs. Um, we just felt like listening to the the album in full, and we had already given it the track listing. It was like, okay, this is gonna open the record. This is track two. This one's a groover. Now we're starting to mess with a little bit of. Uh, trying some new stuff in Warbringer, like harmonized riffs. and Right. Uh, you know what I mean? Try more sludgy, groovy beats or uh, a two-minute song, a five-minute song. You know what I mean? Then things started to change. So some of those tracks... Acoustic piece only. Yeah, exactly. You know, uh, an instrumental that we did in studio just on the fly, 
just to kind of fill in space and have some fun. Uh, so obviously, yeah, none of those were obvious singles. So the first two were just like the strongest songs. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, um, talk to me about um, the next thing that you did. I think it was 2000. Uh, no, it was that would have been 2012. That would have been Hexen, but yeah, one so that, after that so was released for sure. So that, that was that came out, mm -hmm. and then you had been writing for what would be uh, Empire's Collapse. Collapse. Yeah, the only Warbring record to not start with a W. Well, and technically, see, this is something for the fans too. Technically, it was called Warbringer Four, Empire's Collapse. Oh, like colon Empire's Collapse. So it technically does. It just wasn't released that way. But we told everybody it was Warbringer Four, colon. You know what I mean? So, yeah. On a technicality, no, we just Empire's Collapse for for short. But yeah, yeah, it was just different. You know, at that particular time, we had done a hell of a lot of touring for Worlds. You had a line of change too. You had a huge line of change. So Andy, yeah. Andy, Andy Locks, Andy, the has player. to leave for health issues. Yeah. So what had happened was, how far into the cycle was this? So the record was released in fall. We were already starting our first uh, U.S. headline tour, um, and yeah, just gr kind of grinding away. That was it was like nonstop. So it was U.S. headliner for a month and a half, and then we went to Europe for a month and a half right before the holidays. So it was like two and a half weeks headline, two and a half weeks direct support for Arch Enemy. Came back into the states right after New Year, did uh, direct support. It was us, and then Symphony X Iced Earth, um, us Destruction, Vital Remains, us well, some one-offs, right? Uh, fucking here and there, and, and so on that Destruction tour leading up to that is when. Uh, Andy was going through some, some health issues, needed to go back home uh, mid-tour. Uh, it was news to me. I mean, it was a surprise to me. You know what I mean? If we had planned ahead, we could have worked accordingly. He probably wouldn't have come on the tour at all and just stayed home and gotten what gotten he needed better. to get done. And, yeah, it gotten better. And uh, last minute, my buddies from the band Mantic Ritual, Meltdown, as we know him, yep. as how I know him. We, I got to interview Jeff. He told Killer. me this whole, this whole spiel. But yeah, right on. So, yeah, they had moved to L.A. and they were art him and, and uh, Potts. Or Pots and Motsman, P rather. Pots uh, and Mots. Yeah, Pots and Mots. <laughs> we're uh, already in L.A. hanging out, you know what I mean? Just cool cats. And uh, I knew they could play. So when it came down to it, Adam left first. Yes. There was There was a time where Adam had to dip out of the band. Uh, he needed Family money. reasons. Uh, yeah, his grandmother was very ill. You know what I mean? She was. Uh, I heard he wanted to get a job had, too, or something. Like, oh, I mean, at that like, again, at that particular he point, something else. Sure, sure. I mean, and that's that's understandable. When 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 this is all you've done, your live, whole life, living a van, much. oh, your whole professional life, you know, right, adult life. Right. Um, uh, great opportunities came from it, sure, and great experiences that nobody could ever take away, and that's that's always the story. But yeah, sooner or later, again, everybody's older than I am, even Absolutely. even now. Um, so I'm like, okay, these are the things that people want out of life and I'm not here to argue, but we're, you know, we'll, we'll make it happen, you know? So we got to fill in for, uh, a couple of those tours that I had said. So I think Adam's last show was probably January, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I think it was, uh, we did two, two or three shows with Death Angel up in the Bay and then he split, you know, went home, took care of his stuff and then, uh, got to fill in for the next like two tours yeah. Uh, but then, so when Andy left, I was like, all right, so we're going to need a bass player. I know two guys who I love, trust, know that can play. And you guys know them too. This. Yeah, exactly. Because you guys yeah. used to play, you know, yeah, shows all the time. with them all the time. All the time. Mm -hmm. So big fan of theirs already. Not like we got to work a guy in. I just got to give him the songs. So he can nail well, it, um, nail it, show up, and play. And that's exactly what happened. So I called Ben Motsman, uh, who texted me earlier today, actually. I haven't talked to him in a good while. Um and I had him pretty much flown out. I think we were in Chicago about to play Reggie's with Destruction. And that was that. It was pretty much like, here's the set list. This is how much time we have like every night. And if you can learn all these songs, we'll fly you out. We'll rehearse them backstage. If we can get a sound check and explain the situation, I'm sure we can make it happen. So from that particular point on, uh, Ben was uh, pretty much in the band. And he'd done such a good job. And he was such a fucking, he still is such a monster player. Um, you know, uh, when we had the conversation and c kept touring and it felt good and he was a lively individual, uh, you know what I mean? We got along so well and all mm -hmm. that type of thing. I was like, let's keep the guy. You know what I mean? Let's let Andy heal and, and do what he needs to do, et cetera, and we'll keep this guy if he's interested in staying. And that's pretty much how it kind of worked out. So a little later, um, I knew Potts was there and the guy we had filling in. Did not work out. No, it just, I mean, it was pretty much on a fill-in basis until we could make something happen because, you know, Ad Adam was such a, a key component to Warbringer, you know, as their 
uh, original drummer, moving on to the guitar out of necessity, writing some of right. the songs he wrote on Waking and Worlds. And I was like, man, this guy's important, you know, so we need to level up, not just kind of find someone who's adequate. Um, and that's when Potts came into the picture because I was well, like, I, I know he's sitting at home doing nothing. <laughs> not nothing, but you know what I mean? It's like well, playing-wise, playing he's doing his own thing. And It I, was either you or, or Ben that, that gave him the phone call or something, right? The I had asked Potts first. Uh, okay. Right when Adam left, I was like, hey, man, we're going on tour with your favorite band, Symphony X. Will you, jo what, will you join story, us? Yeah. And he's like, dude, I just moved to L.A. I've got nowhere to go. I got no job, no roof over my head, nothing like that. I was like, well, that's perfect, isn't it? But he's like, yeah, I'm not going to have anything to come back to. So I just, sorry, I just can't do it just yet. Like, this right. is like a whole new thing for me. I got no family here. It's literally just me on my own in this fucking, you know, metropolis over here i can that's understandable well, totally totally i i would have been like i don't know what the fuck i'm doing you know if i didn't have a place to go when i got back from the road and figure it out you know we, i mean think hindsight would have figured it out it would have just been for the experience but um yeah six months later he was situated and we made this the same phone call and i was like well we got x shows happening uh are you interested because we all really want you to be a part right. of this because we know you're there we know you're talented we can really use what you have to offer right and you've already played with ben so there's already that dynamic. You know all of us. So, and then that became the Empire's lineup. There you go. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about the recording process of it. It's a very different record. This yeah. was the record where there was not supposed to be Warbringer anymore after this, supposedly, according yeah, to so stories that I've, that I've mm -hmm. been, been told by some of the bandmates. Mm -hmm. uh, this was supposed to be the last ditch effort. The so yeah, this, so this throw was, in uh, everything in the hat and see what happens. See what happens. Yeah. So this was pretty much the, the shift, the, the great shift. It's like, okay, we got this new band. I'm still pretty new, but these guys are brand new. And during the writing, everybody, again, being older, was doing their own thing, trying to find themselves, trying to find any kind of sense of uh, individuality, you know, a, a sense of uh, purpose, you know, within just like the constant right record tour, right record tour that they had been doing for, I don't know, 10 years to that point, I don't know. And uh, again, everybody being older wanted, you know, the, the, the things that anybody would want in life, you know, the, the stability, the security, the income, the w whatever's going to just kind of be like that stable home life that none of them had experienced yet. You know, so John's Lock, John Locke's thinking was very much that way. He was just burnt out. Um, Potts and Motsman were freshened, so they were excited. Uh, myself, you know what I mean? I started to do everything I needed to do. I started to play around, play with different groups, do anything I could do on off time. Um, so as far as the players are concerned, that was very much what had happened there. There were a lot of... The, the reason there's so much variety on that record is because we still jammed in the same room, but everybody wrote at home. Okay. You know what I mean? So it was like John Locks wrote these songs, I wrote these songs, Potts wrote this. Potts and Mossman collaborated on this. So that's why you get so many different sounds. I mean, I, that's still, I'll say, yeah. I'll say it, and mm -hmm. I'll, I've said it once, I'll say it again. Yeah, yeah, again. I've heard you still my favorite cool. record, Yeah, I mean, there's, period, there's, a, there's a lot going on. I mean, we weren't really afraid of anything. There was some stuff where we'd scratch our head and go, can we get away with it? See, that's why I like it. You know what I mean? That's but we, why but I like it was that. like no fucks given when it came down to because it sounded good, it felt good, it felt good in the room. You know, some of the first stuff that Johnny came to me with was, uh, he would have like scars remain over here, but then one dimension over here. I think the first thing he ever showed me was the beginnings of Towers of the Serpent, but we couldn't finish it, so we shelved it and like came back to it later. Um, and then Motsman and Potts had like Iron City, which was very much uh, almost like a meltdown type of song, you know, with the Thin Lizzy ending. I think it's more motorheady um, than yeah, you know, but else. it was like their Literally traditional speaking. form of speed metal. Their right. their, the way they know how to thrash, you know, right. it was very much that style. Um, some of the more progressive stuff like Dying Light was Potts, you know, because he's very much into Queen and, like I said, Symphony X and, and uh, those, the, the guitar playing uh, was very different. He was very different from Adam. He was very different from well, John Locke. the tone Lux. is very different, too. The tone is very, like, not mundane, but it's very, like, fat or, like, like earth. There's a there's a very meaty quality to it that's that's mm -hmm. not on any other Warbringer record. Like yeah, no, this this no particular top, no one. Bottom, yeah, this all mid. I know what you mean. Yeah, this one was very much um, an organic record in terms of production because you listen to World Sun of Sunder, like you're like, holy <laughs> shit! You can hear World Sun of Sunder pump every time you right. hear the fucking snare drum hit. Uh, very produced record. Where this one wasn't. You know, this one we went back to the Omen Room and worked with Steve Evitz again, but 
the difference was that Mick, uh, the mix and the master happened from other people. Uh, Worlds, Steve mixed it, so it came out his way, the way he knew how I to thought, mix a I heavy metal Alan record. I thought Alan mastered Oh, Worlds. okay, so yeah, he mastered, yeah, he mastered both. Oh, he did. He mastered uh, I want to say that he mastered, uh, well, he definitely mastered Empires. I'm pretty sure he mastered Worlds, too, if I'm not mistaken. He did. Yeah, yeah. so, uh, I mean, that's a very different process, but uh, just as far, like, the mix was far more important. And the schedules clash. Uh, Steve had this other project, and we needed it out by here, and this guy wasn't available here, so we had to get this guy. And, you know, it was just... Uh, there was a lot of cooks in the kitchen. There. Yeah, too many too many to make it as cohesive as we wanted to be down to doing everything um, kind of DIY, where we knew it was the last one on Century Media. So John Locke's kind of knowing, he was like, oh, I could wrap this up and kind of call it a day and, and be fulfilled by, you know, the, the artistry of everything I've done uh, and sign off on something I'm, I'm mm-hmm. happy with and, right. and proud of, I'd like to think. Um, we just started hitting up all our friends. So, uh, you know, these guys hit up their friends to do the artwork, or their friends to do the music videos, the, their friends to do the photos, um, the inlay, the booklet, all, all that, the graphic design, etc. You know what I mean? So that was very much like in-house rather than everything. It was the complete opposite of World Sun Asunder for sure. You know, it didn't sound produced the way that did and it wasn't uh, digitize the way it was with all the packaging and all the fancy this, this, or that, right. and the other, or the same artwork by, uh, you know, an artist they'd used before, Dan Seagrave. So it was just a, a departure overall, but... I don't think... Yeah, I don't yeah. think so at all. I, I think it was just its own It's its, it's own, its own thing. thing now, for sure. For sure, I would put it there. You know, going back, when it first, like, came out and we started posting things, fans were like, huh. But uh, look I always loved it, man. The, cool, first, that's the cool. first time I heard it, I'm like, dude, this is my record. Yeah, this some some people record. some people could like felt that they got it for what it was, and a lot of people. When you're a prog guy, it makes total sure, sense. Sure, sure. You know? Yeah, I mean, it was just pushing boundaries in that in that progressive sense. It wasn't like overly technical, I no, thought, but there was a lot to know. offer. You know what I mean? And there was a lot of variety. You know, um, so again, um, like Master of Puppets. There you go. There you go. My uh, my contributions were. Some of the more aggressive stuff that l- leaned a little more towards the like the black metal edge, you know that the black thrash thing, you know the Horizon, the Hunter Seeker, um, off with their heads, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, I mean ultimately it was like, oh, what song do you want to do for the music video? We wanted to do these, and they were like, no, do this one. You know the the powers that be who, had, you know, in- right. were the investors were like, no, you're gonna do this one uh, because. That, I, I remember what we said. you recording it in that that business place, or whatever. I went down, and gave you guys cookies and weed. I remember yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you, the, you stayed or at the, ho- the hotel in Garden Grove. Or oh, whatever, yeah. For yeah. So was it still at Motel Six, or was it somewhere yeah, else at that still, point? Yeah, it was still okay, at Motel cool. Six. Yeah. yeah, I mean that that was just like the extended stay that was right around the corner, and there was a great diner at the corner. You know yeah, what I mean? So and, and there was just everything was convenient or whatever. So you too. had the studio, you had the mo- hotel, mm-hmm. and then yeah, just a bunch of stuff around there because Disneyland was, was right there. That was the first time I think I met. Jeff and uh, and Ben. Too. Okay, cool. Right Obviously, on. I was a huge fan too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So definitely. I yeah. was not. I, I was not like where I am today sure. as it was back then. So I was still up and coming uh-huh. a little bit. I feel you. And uh, they were very nice. Like they they had. Yeah, always had been. Because mm-hmm. I had met them when they when they all first came to L.A. to play as Meltdown at the Whiskey, and then again on the Hexen tour, there was like a week's worth of the West Coast, so they were like regional support. And they're uh, very the hum- they're very humbling too. Yeah. I mean, they kn- they know their shit. Yeah, still when are. I, when I told them my band, they knew exactly who, cool. who we were. It cool, was cool. like that's fucking awesome. Mm-hmm. Like yeah, making a definitely feel in the know way. for sure of just like everything that was going on because they were a part of it. You know, they, I mean, it didn't happen as substantial as uh, maybe they wanted it to happen with with Mantic because they did the one record right. and you know again, happen. li- life happens right. you know you want to go back to that episode you can check out their story so. I haven't seen it yet so I'm going to check it out okay yeah definitely it's just us two talking shit for 2 hours it's all like, good. Just no that's like bad so. I mean that's what's happening here um so talk mm-hmm. to me about I mean obviously the initial reception and reaction to empires was not to your guys's liking yeah um I remember, I think you guys played with In This Moment at oh, The shit, Grove. Really? really? I think it was The Grove. And, and I remember <laughs> you en- you ended the show with Towers of the Serpent. Damn. Best ending song ever, dude. Damn. That, oh, thanks. That was no, the that's shit. a good one. Yeah, we brought that back into the set, too. That's, um, that's a monster of a song. And Morrow was, uh, was doing merch for you guys. Oh, okay. So, no, that, that was, I, I'm glad it wasn't that band. Um, t- opinion. Don't give a fuck. But, yeah. um, I no, that was, uh, I thought was. I thought it was In This Moment. It was a chick no. singer. Really? Chick yeah. Singer? What chick the singer. fuck door was that? Yeah. Mara was doing merch. I think he only ever did merch it, on one tour. and it I have the it, picture, dude. Really? It would have been uh, Overkill oh, no, Creator. No, no. 
the, no, no, no. Uh, the uh, the uh, not the agonist. Is that what the the whoever oh. the chick from whoever the chick from um, uh, Arch Enemy came from? Yes. Um, Fuck, what's the name of that band? Yeah, that whatever. I think so. That I think it's. I think it's. Yeah. yeah. So whatever that band was, that okay. was the tour that that was happening for um, Empires. Anyway, point really? being, really, music that was a great fucking. The hell was I? Because I recall North America was only uh, us, Creator Overkill, and then after the fact, then it was Johnny and us. Johnny and I split. Then it was that. Then it was the Creator Overkill Warbringer. And then I think on an off day is when we had a you show had, y- yes. on Bonded by Blood's tour, where it was Bonded by Blood. The Agonist, something Black like, Guard, yeah, so, something else happening yes. over here, and we just got thrown on that show because yes. it was routing to our next show. Yes. But Morrow was there. Yes. Yeah, fully. For, no, that for some I reason, for I sure. remember all the shit. I don't cool, know why. Cool. No, that's good. That's good. You're jogging my memory. I was like, <laughs> wait a minute. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, that's really good. Uh, Goddamn. Yeah, I mean, that's my really memories. Good. My memory is shit. Spot but, on. You know. Spot on. <laughs> um, but uh, just, I just remember the initial reaction for the record mm-hmm. was not like, to where I'm like, are you hearing the same thing I'm hearing? Because I yeah, hear something I, completely different. And it was challenging. Like a lot of people, maybe it was the production because it was so different. Because I think it was, it was mixed. Material. I think it, that too. I mean, because I was like, all right, well, if we've got to put something out first, the first thing out was Hunter Seeker, and I was right. like, that's the fastest thing. It's got blast beats in the chorus. Yeah. Um, it's still very metal, but it didn't. Maybe it didn't sound like a, a metal record. And the next thing to come out was that Black Sun Black Moon video that our yeah. friends did again. You know, what I mean? so I had this yeah. quality to it and that type of song was different um but i mean you put on the record and it's like it opens up a certain way then it's you know this like groove industrial tune then it's like this pop punk song then it's hunter Great. seeker and then it's you know then it's this and then it's that right. and it just that happens the entire time so yeah it was uh, it was a challenge for said fan base who only knew the first three and wanted total war right well you're you know what i mean go listen to total war yeah exactly. so the thing so and then let's talk so you get off of the the label after mm-hmm. this mm-hmm you're in limbo here. You, you've signed to Napalm Records. Oh, so that's you, after the fact, yeah. Yes, yeah, so then you put out Woe to the Vanquish. So talk to me about the replacement members and, uh-huh. and kind of like where So, yeah, at were. that particular point, uh, a bit of a foreshadowing calling it Empire's Collapse because that's pretty much what, what happened. It well, was the cover it, says it all, too. Yeah, fully. So it was a rebuilding of mm-hmm. the band, right? you know, at that particular uh, time, and it was very much just... <laughs> <laughs> no, you're good. Don't you worry. Take the time. Kicking shit over here. This is here. empty, so let's fix that. Yeah, let's fix that right now. So yeah, the reason why I'm bringing it up or whatever is the cover is definitely foreshadowing where the band was at at the time. You guys sure. were exhausted. Dude. Yeah, that's that's another too. And um, at that particular time, uh, again, personal lives, and I guess the priority for whatever the individual was took precedence over the collective and took precedence over the band and the business and all of that. So it was whatever's in the best interest of the individual at that particular time, whether it was uh, personal things that the people needed to take care of um, or just things that people wanted to do or not do. So that was pretty much it where it was like, okay, we're going to you know, p- hit the brakes on this stuff. Uh, the band went off and did a tour that was uh, that, you know, out of obligation in Europe. Um, on Empires, and that was pretty much it. Then it was a rebuilding, some more shows happened, didn't really hit a nerve with anybody. Uh, The potential writing for the fifth record started to happen, but it didn't really work out. Um, And this is all from this side of the chair. I don't know. I wasn't in the know of anything like that. But, um, yeah, once once everything kind of settled, I went off. And, you know, I'll, I'll go... Into I'm gonna get to the other records you were on in between. In, That's completely on. fine. We'll stick to the, to the Warbringer stuff. To no, no. The, oh yeah, the band. to the bands. We, yeah, we no, said at the beginning of the show we'd stick to the bands. Totally fine. And then I'll tell totally fine. The rest yeah. of the story. So again, so more work happened for me uh, in between, and it led to um, because you were initially out of Warbringer, and then you joined mm-hmm. back into it. Exactly. If I'm not, if mm-hmm. I have my story correct, if I'm yeah, again, uh, the the priority of the individual, whatever was in their best interest. You know, I had a lot of stuff happening at home, family, health, life or death situations, etc. Um, so it, it was pretty much everybody was on that page, and it just kind of became a, you know, survival was like keyword. Right. So at that particular point, you know, getting back in touch with Marco and John and talking, and um, what had happened was there was a tour scheduled. And they were interested in doing it right and getting the right people to do it. So uh, Adam was there. John was there. They had reached out to me. Obviously, I know them, and we've done plenty of work together prior. Uh, and then we filled up the lineup, you know, got the five-piece back together, 
and then went into right uh, after that tour. So it was like do the tour, which was like a two month tour with Enforcer, the first one. And then oh, was that the no 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 yeah no. Exmortis Cauldron that, that Enforcer was that tour. Warbring yeah so that was the initial thing so before Woe was even like a thought right, so that was the from, you know, beyond, from beyond tour yeah exactly for them and Warbringer was just still kind of just like oh we're back and active and we're gonna hit the stage again so let's go out Here and do go. it because the rest of the bands on that tour had new records and we didn't so Exmortis just put out yes they just put out right forth so yeah this was and then Cauldron put out in ruin yeah exactly and then they had just put out from beyond. Yeah, yeah, that was definitely 2016. So, yeah, um, it was a great tour, good fun. Everybody got along. Two months. I uh, got to play an Enforcer. And that was the tour that uh, Cauldron got yeah, injured they, on. Exactly, yeah. So, they cut out the last week and a half or so. You know what I mean? I, I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad they're okay. Yeah, everybody made it through, thankfully. They're still Every, out yeah, records. they're still working. They're still putting out records. That new God's record has some cool tracks on it. Everybody's working. Um,. Yeah, glad, glad that everything turned out for the best. Like, right. the best-case scenario right. out, of, out of such a shit situation. Yeah. So I'm, I'm happy for that, because that's everybody's fucking fear. You know what I mean? Especially on the road, especially for so damn long. Um, uh, but at that particular time, yeah, that was the... Again, just, okay, I, I started to play around already, and I was capable of doing so many things. So at mid-tour, towards the, the latter half of it... Um, it was just one of those situations. Enforcer was already using a fill-in drummer, and he had some visa issues crossing between the Canadian and U.S. border, and they were looking and kind of brainstorming, and I was just backstage warming up for the show, and I overheard their conversation. I was like, hey, man, you guys need help? And they were like, yeah. And it's like, I'm here. I'm like, right here. You know what I mean? Give me your set list. I've already been listening to it for a month plus. You know what I mean? Just like, tell me which songs are priority, and we'll make it happen. You know, so I'm less than a week, learned like 11 songs going so you, in. You have, that, you have that as a musician in your brain. That's awesome. Yeah, I'll okay, get just training yeah. by ear. It's floating yeah. somewhere back there. You know what I mean? Just put the pieces together, Goes learn the song. back to when you first started playing music. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, so just learn all this. That, learn know? the structures. You can chart them out the way my brain knows how to make any chart if I need a visual reference. But it was usually just kind of like learn it by ear. Learn the foundation first. Learn the song. Right. Learn the beats. Put the beats in place. What are the fills? What are the transitions? Oh, they play some songs to click and some songs not. Right. So already it was like, oh, okay, never played with this band before. They got click tracks. I got to play to click, so they're dead on because there's all this extra stuff happening. Uh, so that was one of the first instances where on tour, mid-tour, in the moment, learn all this stuff immediately, get on stage. That's you know what I mean? Like You're we had, crazy. Thanks, man. You're fucking crazy. Yeah, it was pretty badass. Uh, the first show was uh, Park Theater uh, in uh, Manitoba area of Canada. And luckily I was like, all right, well, this is the first show with Enforcer, so I've... Like, uh, I was like, Warbringer, like, I got a sound check with these guys. We're going to take up the whole sound check. We got there early enough to do so. And I was like, cool, we're going to play the entire set before we play the show. It was fine. Oh, okay. Played the whole, played the whole thing pre-show, played the show, no mistakes, killed it. You know, so we did that for a week. Um, and that was a good practice in, like... And then you get, you start the writing process for Woe. Exactly. Yeah, so post post tour, that was when... Everybody was pretty much just like fired up. Who's got ideas? You know what I mean? It pretty much started from scratch. You know, if John had an idea, um, it was a title, it was a, a line, a lyric line, a concept, something. If Adam had riffs, he had um, riffs that we could demo, riffs that I could just go over, record really quick, and then uh, this Put it is... all together. Yeah, so this is where the skill that I had, had developed in Hex and behind the computer, it wasn't Guitar Pro, now it was actual recording. Like Studio uh, Drummer or something? Yeah, like exactly. That, yeah. Using Easy Drummer and using uh, just plugins directly DI and kind of reamping some stuff. Um, and this is something that a skill set that I learned in between the Warbringer process because I had been doing a lot of composition work for some, some companies. Um, for like music for visual media, TV, right. radio ads, stuff like that. So I needed to n learn how to record everything myself anyway. So that skill and the Hexen skill just translated uh, into writing all of Water the Vanquish pretty much. So it's like... Um, and you worked with a new producer, too. Yeah. Yeah, I love this guy. His name is Mike Plotnikoff out in Woodland Hills, uh, Fallbrook area at West Valley Studios. So he's... Uh, the studio owner is Howard Benson, who's like big-time producer, you know what I mean? Done everything from Kelly Clarkson to Santana to Hoobastank to, right. you know, Platinum Records all over the wall, Grammy uh, certificates all over the wall, stuff like that. Um, so writing was very much... Pretty much core composers of myself... And then John and Adam. John more so with arrangement ideas, Adam with some music, but I would the majority of the time I would take his music and turn something, turn a song 
create a song pretty much out of the few riffs that he felt go- went together. Right. You know, so it was uh, one of those things where, say, uh, silhouettes, he had the verse riff and then this middle riff. So it was my job to, like, find a way to connect the two, bridge the gap. So John and I really fucking chiseled that one, and it became what it became. What of the Vanquish, he had pretty much every riff for. So at that point, I came in, just helped him demo it, help him structure it, mm-hmm. you know, and... Uh, Let's see, Remain Violent. I remember demoing Remain Violent, and I had the one riff, the, the riff, because it's all fucking one riff. And John had the, the vocal idea and the hook idea already, so it was pretty much just him and I tag teaming that. And um, that was probably one of the few songs where him and I got together um, with Adam in person and jammed out and kind of structured together and worked it out that way, because my first demo with the Remain Violent riff in it was like, five minutes had all this bullshit happen and all these crazy changes blasting this melodic fucking thing. I was like, well, this riff is great. Everything else around it, kind of fluffy. Let's di- ditch all of it. Meat potatoes. Let me find a way to open the tune, get to this riff. Boom. We've already got this like vocal hook, so let's go here. Uh, and then that's pretty much it. You know what I mean? We'll, we'll do some changes in the middle so these guys can play some solos. Just, you know, just make it a fucking crusher, you know? So then, then the record comes out. It's a, uh, it's, Kind of a you know it can it got a huge reception to it yeah and then Power Trips, Nightmare Logic comes out and just oh, yeah. fucking demolishes any album that ever came ever out came out ever in, yeah in, and it in, came out before ours did but pretty much just in the yeah, w- in, the, in the wake of of Nightmare Logic yeah that it was just a very like big thing took any any record that yeah, came that, out two thousand seven yeah I mean hanging out with those guys over the summer was badass so it was one of those instances where hearing about it firsthand in the know of right. being with them. Uh, yeah, very powerful so, record and it's still. It's a great record, man. Oh yeah, not, not big knocking fan. it one one bit. Mm-hmm. I've just had I just had my my uh, preference. Or le- I don't no, know. I had my record come out in uh-huh. 2017 that I thought was really rad. Sure. That got gained some tr- a lot of traction mm-hmm. too, and then you know everyone's always just power trip, power trip, power trip. Sure. So it was kind of happened to to you guys though with whoa. I think. Yeah, it was a little different. I mean, because at that particular time, writing all of whoa. There were a few bands kind of doing the same thing, uh, you know, whether they were writing or hyping it up that they were going into the studio. So timelines were a little similar. Right. Them included, Havoc included. But all three of our records, I mean, they were, mm. they were big it, just for our, our camp. Sure. Or whatever. So, you mm-hmm. know, 2017 was a big fucking year for metal. Yeah, definitely. I feel 2020 is going to be a big one, too. Yeah, I agree. You're, you're getting ready to, um, in the final stages of your new record... Mm-hmm. And uh, we're just now starting ours, so our okay. both of ours will be will be m- making record next year. Yeah, so next feel, year likely. Yeah, I feel next year will be a great another year. great one. Fuck yeah! You no, know, I'm excited just like for it. So 2017 was like that. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you I'm need really that excited time. for it, man. Yeah, me too. You need that time. And lastly, for the for the Warbringer camp, mm-hmm. for the Warbringer story, uh, tell me, um, you guys just recorded the record, right? So yeah, so this would be number six. Re- number six. Yeah. Don't tell me any titles. All I don't right. want to know. That's all good. Uh, just give me. I guess overview the, an overview. Sure, you know before because you're gonna so have to do 500 other uh, interviews that aren't like this. So. Yeah, later on though. Yeah, you know so what I mean? That, that's that's post yeah. likely in post yeah. where this is in pre and this is cool. Right, you know, this is talk pre, so chat. this is very different. Yeah, huh? so this is very. Uh, <laughs> you, you heard it here first. Yeah. Um, so very much along the same lines as Woe to the Vanquish stylistically. So no, no, uh, you didn't veer off into like any cleans, no, uh, no, no okay. keyboard so pr- pr- stuff. No, pretty much what I, what I meant by that was that uh, core composer, still myself, John Keevil and Adam, and that particular team just uh, just works and, and has its sound and that style. Dynamic, if, if you've heard, yeah, if you've heard uh, Woe to the Vanquish, then uh, the anticipation for this one is going to be just as up to par. So if you're a fan of Woe to the Vanquish, there's going to be a lot of new ground covered. A lot of new things brought to the songwriting, to the use of all the instruments, uh, including vocals. Um, but it's the same team, same team as far as production goes. So we're back at West Valley with Mike. Uh, we'll likely still have Howie Weinberg master it after the fact because that dude's just a fucking monster. Um, and it'll be on Napalm. It'll be on. Assuming. It'll be our second record on Napalm. Uh, we're gonna have the same artist who did the Woe cover do this one. So pretty much you're, you're gonna same, same, you're gonna same. see you know the the next step. But along the same lines, so uh, I wouldn't expect a complete fucking 180, but it's something new. I feel it's something very original, and it's very us. I'm excited to hear it, man. Yeah. Let's go to, so uh, that was pretty much the, the bulk of your career, but I, there's some there's some iffies here that I have that I want yeah, to touch, touch bases. Cool. So in 2013, mm. um, 
you had done keyboards for a track for uh, Trapped in Perdition. Oh, the Fuel by Fire record. Yes. Yeah, so I w again, so in between Empires and getting in gear with Warbringer again, I was telling you I did a lot of the composition right, right. stuff. So that's pretty much just me on my own. Okay. Writing whatever I can. So out of necessity, you learn the tools and the trades of uh, audio production. Did you just send them the keyboard track? Pretty much. I, pretty much what I told, uh, and I was in contact with Chris, you know, uh, FBF and now Skeletal Remains uh, full time. So pretty much I, I had asked him, I was like, oh, you just give me, this is what I'm going to need for you in order to program it. So right. that way there's no confusion and your guy can just go ahead and pop. You know, exactly just insert, insert that audio and he, you mix it as you please. Right. Um, so that was the back and forth that we had there. So that was pretty much it. It was a really small thing, but they wanted, they wanted, that was new for them, the use of any kind of Keyboard, extra layer, yes, yes. Uh, any kind of effects, any kind of ambient thing happening amongst all everything that they had written prior. So that was it. That was a pretty straightforward thing. I'm like, send me the tune. Um, you're, if you haven't recorded anything else to a metronome, you're going to have to record this so that way we can just insert it directly. Give me a tempo. And they don't use a uh, metronome. No, a lot of the click track. Yeah, exactly. Now, Fuel by Fire, uh, mm -hmm. Carlos, I don't think uses one. So that was pretty much the, the one requirement I right. needed from Chris, where I was like, if you want me to do it without me physically being there, Here's what at I'm a convenient, this is all I need from you. Just give me the tempo, give me the riff, I'll do Boom. it, send it to you, insert it, and you're good. So that was uh, the credit there. That was funny that they gave me that credit at all because I was like, oh, yeah, just take it. You know what yeah. I mean? It's like I'm just happy to help. Um, and then, so speaking of Skeletal, yeah. you do the Condemned uh, to Misery record. Mm -hmm. um, why? I was at work one day and uh, driving home and Chris calls me. He's like, hey, man, uh, we're gearing up for a second record. I've got pretty much damn near everything written, a lot of this stuff demoed. Uh, don't have a drummer, but we got to get this record done. Do you want to do the record? And I'm like, yeah, man. Uh, at that particular point, uh, I'm not in Warbringer, just working from home, doing all the composition stuff. So very much integrated into a very different kind of music and composing a lot. Um, and I was like, yeah, why not? Still have this skill. Uh, I knew going into a record like that, it's going to level me up in a sense that, okay, I've never had to play double bass this fast. I've never had a blast beat this fast. This is death metal. You know what I mean? Right. It's like I, I grew up in the heavy metal thing, the thrash thing, right. uh, with with whatever other elements that I've included into Warbringer, but um, nothing is like Ex extreme as yes. this. So, yeah, that was a fun record. I love that record. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, me too. I love hearing that that uh, record or just seeing it live, whether it's me or not. Just like those guys, just crush everything in sight. It's, it's just so fucking heavy. So the new one, very excited about, or the latest SR record, but that particular one was a lot of fun. Um, still DIY in stages too, man. Yeah, they DIY. Still they were still pretty much. It was the second record on the indie label. Mm -hmm. um, so we recorded at a buddy's place in their neck of the woods, which isn't too far. I forget what city specifically it was in, but they're Executor out of Studios is at Pico Rivera. Okay, so yeah, that's because they're in Whittier and Pico's right next door, and the right. rehearsal space was in Pico, so I wasn't sure. Yeah, and then the last thing for your musical career that I have is Ex Mortis's Sound of Steel record, oh, yeah. which you uh, did the drums for. Mm -hmm. You went so. What I'm told is, and and I'll let you elaborate more on it, is sure. um, they sent you up to Sharkbite to do the drums. Mm -hmm. And I think, I don't know if the whole band was there. I think, according to Conan, I think it was just you guys. No, we all went. Oh, you all went. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So pretty much leading into that record, let's see. That was it last started, year. It, so. Yeah, it started with a tour. So Warbringer had played its last show, probably being like not fest. I, I want to say it was with the Not Fest Festival, and then the next thing we were supposed to do was a tour. It was Exmortis, Warbringer, and Darkest Hour. Just a quick West Coast run. Um, and unfortunately, half of Exmortis left, so then my guitar player, Chase Becker, and I were like, okay, cool. We can fill in, no problem. We'll play double sets every night. There's only 15 shows. It's not too bad, so we'll do double duty yeah, every he night. Did, he did 50 for you, so. Exactly. So <laughs> fair trade. Fair trade. I mean, we're brothers. We've known each other for so long. So it was like, yeah, I mean, you need help, bro, man. We got you. You know what I mean? No, no big deal. So it was one of those things where we did that tour, knocked out all of it uh, December 1st to the mid-December. So while everybody's, you know, celebrating the holidays and such, I'm in my garage grinding out all this new Ex Mortis material. Because um, he already has a book to where, like, the second day of June, I got to be up in Oakland. Right. So we, uh, I got everything pretty much done. He was sending me updates as the songs were being changed. But I mean, I felt pretty competent at that time within my own playing to just be like, cool, I'm going to do something that has never been heard on an Ex Mortis record, and I'll do my thing with the way Conan writes his songs. There you go. And uh, I, th I think it came out. I mean, it was pretty much natural. I just, I just kind of, yeah, I didn't overthink it. I just went with instinct on the playing. Um, 
And that's that's just kind of how it kind of came to be. So yeah, went up to Oakland, went up to Shark Bite, worked with producer Zach Oren, um, who I had never met personally before, but he had worked with Warbringer because he mixed Waking Into Nightmares, and that's where they recorded it. So there was already some a little connection there. Um, but we all went up there. We all stayed at the shitty hotel down the block, hung out. Um, you know, I did my drum tracks. Uh, it's like, fuck, how many days did I take? Yeah. Maybe like two or three. You know, I, we gave him some space, but overall, it's like with, with Ex Mortis, it was, um, you know, there were the songs that were like the front runners, and we had been playing one of them live the whole tour before, so that one was obviously the most right. prepared and rehearsed because I could, you know, write, right. the, write the drum part to it. Everything else just kind of happened, whether in the moment or out of collaborating uh, in the studio with Zach and Conan just saying, what do you think of this part? What do you think of this transition, this fill, whatever, whatever. So that was the latest like thing I could do with that type of music, that sound. Very different from Skeletal, very different from Absolutely. Warbringer, very different from... It's a great record, man. Thanks, Dude. thanks. Yeah, I had a lot of fun with that one. A lot of cool stuff happening. And, and as instrumental as uh, the guitars can be and the bass could be, I was like, okay, cool, well, I have to level up just as much. I can't... Yeah, your rhythm section keeps foundation and the guitars paint all over right. it all the time. But I was like, no, I'm just gonna I'm gonna be right there with it, you and, know, and, uh, and do something uh, no one's ever heard on an Ex Mortis record. So that was yeah, a lot, that was a lot was of fun. Blasting, I think. For, yeah, exactly. Not the first time, but you know, in a long time. Yeah, in a very long time. Yeah, the, um, very different band now than it used to be in the demo or like DIY album days. Yeah. I still want to mention there's two bands. Yeah. And then we'll 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 call it. I want to thank you sure. oh, yeah. for giving me two plus hours of your time. No I, shit. I it doesn't even feel it. like it. Of course, because you're it's, talking about yourself. It's great. I guess I'm not, I'm not a big fan it. of doing so, but just no, like I sharing it, stories it, is that's is what fun. We're doing right here, you know, man. that's pretty much it. I'm, we're bouncing yeah. off each other. That's what it is. Definitely. Um, mm-hmm. No, this has been a great time. Uh, presence. Cool. That's unique. Yeah. So that's well, pretty. You did, it's like a jazz typey like a record. A right? little, a prog- a little bit. Progressive type. A little record. bit. Yeah. Pretty much, it was like Floyd worship. Like it was guitar in it. Yeah. So I pretty much played musical chairs. It's me and my high school buddies who I still hang out with to this day. Still talk to it. Be like damn near as much as I can. Trying to hang out with them tomorrow. Uh, play catch up because I haven't seen anybody in God knows how long, and um, yeah, just four of my buddies. It was a it was a quintet. It was two guitars, bass, drums, keyboard, and we r- did some demoing. Put out a demo. I think the biggest thing we ever did was uh, support Fate's Warning at the Whiskey. Uh, that night was crazy though because we played. We only had half an hour. We played four songs because the long the songs are kind of long, and uh, we sold like thirty CDs. I was like, God damn, what local band like brand new, no one's ever heard of, sells that many goddamn CDs and like of uh, you know playing a thirty minute set. Uh, when not the whole, when not everybody's there yet. And you that's know what, what I mean? 2013, 2014. Uh, came some out? somewhere in that time frame. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, it's still going. We do it all for fun, but it just started off as a jam band. When I wasn't on tour, instead of driving an hour every which way to get to whatever rehearsal, uh-huh. th- my boys, they're ten minutes down the street. So you can yeah. just jam. Yeah, we could just go there, have a couple drinks, you know, indulge in whatever, whatever, have some fun, jam. Uh, we started off just jamming like Sabbath. I was playing drums, homie was singing, one guitar, one bass, and then we just started playing musical chairs. You know, oh, you play drums now, I'll play guitar. Right. And then we just started writing this original stuff, and it was like, damn, this is actually really cool. So we went with it. Heck yeah! So man. Th- there's and that. And then, and then the last thing I want to do, I've never, I've never heard mm. of this. Uh, Rosita Rain. Oh, Rosita. Rosita Rain. Rosita Rain? Yeah, so Rosita is just where I'm from. That's right, the name of the city. It, but you do all the instrumentation. So what kind yeah. of project is it? Uh, that was just something. Uh, I remember at the time my father was unfortunately sick, so pretty much I would go to the hospital, and I just wanted an outlet to just fucking play music. You know what I mean? So I was just in my room a lot playing acoustic. And that's pretty much what came from it. I just started riffing. And at that time, I was doing all the TV stuff, composition stuff. So I, it was a practice in playing, writing, trying something new, and just literally, oh, how to work a microphone, how to work, you know what I mean, an interface, how to work right. uh, Logic Pro. You know what I mean? That was pretty much it. I so it was, it was a practice in that, for you, sure. You've had a lot of fucking, a lot of musical j- uh, endeavors so far, sir. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's and I, fun. and here's to here's to, to to many more. Thanks, man. I appreciate and, uh, it. And mm-hmm. to both of our careers, because I guess I have Cheers. one now. So there you go. There you go. Had a boy. There yeah. you go. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Episode forty. I'm out of here. I want to thank Mr. Carlos Cruz. Yeah, by all means. Thanks for, for having me, me brother man. And, and uh, thanks to anybody who cares to watch. I hope this we can do fun. it again too. I'd love yeah, to definitely. get the opportunity to. Mm-hmm. I always got, get like yeah, the Ohm stuff's too. happening around. The Chris Poland stuff. Uh, we're doing some solo stuff just so, so people are aware of it. Uh-huh. You know, so Ohm is going to be the jazz fusion trio instrumental. It's myself, Robbie Pag, and Chris Poland. Uh, and then Chris Poland is going to be doing some solo stuff, new stuff, shred guitar. Fun. You know, Return to Metropolis, like the next yes. of that. So he's record. doing that bit, and it's going to be a bit more speed metal, a bit more of the guitar oriented music that everybody loves Chris Poland for. Uh, yeah. I'm excited, man. Yeah, so me too. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate it. Definitely. Cheers, guys. We're out of here. Thank you.